when I say morality, I mean like what we talk about is morality. I feel like a lot of it is intuitively derived. Um, and I think a lot of those intuitions uh, actually supersede so much of what somebody else might actually believe in. Um, so for example, this, this would be like a question I would challenge somebody. I find that sometimes um, atheists in their arguments against Christianity actually uh, are anti-scientific, I think, or they, they don't use evidence. So um, can I give you a couple of examples of that? Yeah, go for it. What do you think about Jesus' resurrection from the dead? Um, I mean, obviously I think it didn't really happen. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. uh, I know that historians debate. I, I think most historians believe Jesus was a real person. Um, most secular historians, uh, although I think there's even some debate about that, but I, in terms of like a resurrection, I don't believe obviously that that ever happened, yeah. Uh, I think I think that's a bit wrong. Um, why, why is someone saying something counts evidence? It does in law. What, what, where are we going with this? In in a law court, somebody just saying just saying something might the whole thing might might hang on somebody just um, saying something. Yeah, hold on. Let me think about this for a second. Um, nice to be here during COVID. Um, Do you mean that yeah. uh, actually or sarcastically? <laughs> no, no, I mean that the Australia has gone reasonably well during COVID. It's been pretty well organized and mm -hmm. hasn't, hasn't been chaos. Gotcha. How was your there, time away? My, uh, my time away is great. Uh, it's always been fun to travel. Um, how, the, how well Australia has done during COVID seems to be uh, very much uh, tied to the political beliefs of the person that I'm talking to. So. I think most Australians um, say it's gone okay, but if you talk to just on the internet, I tend to select, I guess, for more conservative Australians, will say that it's been oh, okay. a little yeah, yeah. Yeah, impressive. Yeah. They think we've been under a dictatorship and so on, yeah, yeah, I understand. I will say, of all the conservative stuff I've heard in terms of like, you know, uh, Australia and their treatment of everything, the one thing that I was sympathetic towards was the inability of people that, that our native Australians who live in Australia to get back to Australia was apparently a problem for a while. I am sympathetic. Uh, that. Yes, mm -hmm. I think that's fair. I think that's a fair criticism. That's been really tough. Yes. Yeah. But then on the and flip side, you've got places like the US where we'll lock down travel from places, but then 10,000 more Americans will come from those places over the next few weeks. I was like, well, what the fuck was the point of locking down? So I'm, I'm yeah. sympathetic to both <laughs> sides on that. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <clears throat> um, yeah. Okay, I have everything set up and good to go on my end. So you tell me when we're, when we're live. We're good, we're live, we're all ready to go, yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to introduce yourself again for everybody so everybody can know who you yeah, are? Yeah, sure. So, so my name is Gordon Menzies. Um, I am an author and an academic. So I'm an author of um, this book called Western Fundamentalism. And that's there's two basic ideas in that book. The first is that everybody is a fundamentalist uh, in the sense that we all rely on unprovable beliefs uh, to set up our worldviews. And the second idea is that uh, when it comes to Western people, the kind of fundamentalists that Westerners are is we have a, a certain notion of freedom, which is that um, if you have ever increasing economic, sexual and political freedom, that moral progress is inevitable, and I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I'm also an economics professor in an Australian university, UTS, and um, I've been on this, uh, I've interacted with you, Destiny, a couple of times. Uh, we've talked about economics and ethics, which is one of my research interests. I have a doctorate from Oxford, and um, a couple of times Christianity's come up when we've been talking as a sort of side issue, uh, but seeing as Christmas is coming up, I. Uh, contacted you and asked you whether we could talk about it directly. Gotcha. So. Um, I hope this isn't a disappointing conversation for you because I, I'm. We might end up agreeing on a lot more than maybe you think. I'm not sure because uh, I don't talk about religion too much. But yeah, okay. we'll see. I guess. Um, where do you want to start? Well, um, here's a here's a possible plan, but it's up for negotiation. Possible plan is we talk about definitions for a little while because I've heard you say some interesting things about. Atheism. Okay. Um, get some clear definitions down. Sure. Um, I thought then, although I know that most, the way that most people um, get their beliefs about most things is that they uh, listen to someone that they trust 
um, or in love, and then they believe those things until they have a good reason otherwise. So most people acquire their beliefs that way, but still sometimes it is possible to talk about things fairly rationally. And so I'd like to talk about whether a rational person might want to believe in Christianity or atheism, mm -hmm. the reasons for that, and then basically anything else we want to talk about. Okay. Gotcha. Sounds good. So what's your, um, tell me about your atheism or oh, you might call yourself an atheist. Tell me about what your beliefs are. Um, yeah. So I, I don't really believe in the existence of any like higher powers, um, or extra physical stuff, I guess. Um, so I think that in and of itself would make me an atheist. I, I'm obviously receptive to the idea that there could be something else. Uh, I, I don't really like the term agnostic because I think every reasonable atheist to some extent should be open to the possibility of being incorrect. Um, <clears throat> that, that, that in and of itself could get more complicated too. But yeah, I, I'll just answer that basically. Yeah. I, so as an atheist, I don't believe in the existence of any like supernatural or extra higher power or anything. Yeah. Okay. So um, is a naturalist a fair description that this is a closed universe and um, there's no extra stuff going on supernaturally? Um, uh, so this is going to be very unsatisfying uh, and it tortures the hell of all my philosophy friends, but I am ultimately skeptical about any absolute claims of knowledge. So while I'll say that like I'm a naturalist or a materialist or a physicalist, I've heard these terms used kind of interchangeably in regards to this. Um, I'm not ever going to make the claim I know with absolute certainty that the only thing that exists is the natural world because um, there could be something else out there and I just don't believe we have the sensory organs to interpret it or understand it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I get that. Mm -hmm. um, so although you don't like the term agnostic, a lot of people would call what you just said agnosticism. Mm -hmm. um, in this now there's two kinds of agnostic so so what i'm hearing is um what i think is a, a realistic kind of humility which says that um i can't know for sure there isn't a god but i don't believe that there is one yeah basically yeah okay now there's a couple of different kinds of ag agnostics or in the space that you occupy there's a couple of different um ways of of playing that space one way is to say um I don't personally know whether there are uh, extra physical beings and that kind of thing. And another one, another way to play it is to say, I am sure that no one can ever know. Which which of those would you be comfortable with? If we're having a casual conversation, I define this a bit differently. But if we're getting into the weeds on this, um, I, I have a really hard time making any absolute statement in terms of like, nobody else can know this particular thing or these things are unknowable to all people uh for okay. instance it could be the case that maybe there's like a, a another sense that would allow us to see things like moral fact or some godlike figure uh, maybe one person one day will be born with that but right now i operate under the assumption that all humans are like me all future humans will be like me in terms of how we interpret the world and insofar as humans exist right now and i think in the foreseeable future will exist we whatever god might be is unknowable to us so i don't know how where, where that fits into so i would more or less say like yeah i don't think this is a knowable thing but maybe in the future some other human could develop a sense organ or something that would allow them to know it yeah uh what about the possibility not saying you believe this, but we're just talking about possibilities. Uh -huh. What about the possibility that a God could communicate to humans? You, you put it in terms of humans having an extra sensory or um, something. What is about it, that possible? It's, I mean, like, is that possible? It is. So if we're talking about something like, say, like a divine revelation, the problem about yeah. revelation is that that seems to be something that ties into like a personal experience that is untranslatable to another person. Uh, so I don't know if this, if, if I'm getting solipsistic, but I can't ever truly know what is in the mind of another person. So, I mean, I guess it could happen, but there would be no way for me to ever know about it. So I discount it as being like a, a possibility, I guess, unless I were to have a personal revelation, yeah. a personal okay. right. revelation. Uh, yeah. You think, you think it's possible, but you say that there are so many difficulties in humans communicating that even if that happened to somebody, you doubt that you could actually receive that mm -hmm. secondhand. Yeah, I don't okay. believe we can communicate like qualia. We can never communicate from one person to another. And some form of personal experience seems to be by definition a qualia and it's incommunicable. Um, we only communicate those by saying it's like something else, right? Is how I feel. Yeah. Hmm. Um, 
You, um, okay, that's interesting that you don't think that we can ever ultimately communicate. I, I would say we can communicate pretty well, but not perfectly. I would I mean, say, oh, go ahead. Uh, so yeah, so I, I would say that, um, um, I mean, it's kind of interesting. I, I did, um, I've, I've done a little bit of um, study at a master's level in theology, and I remember reading about hermeneutics and this, is this whole possible, this whole issue of communication and, uh -huh. and how language works. And you can list off millions and millions of problems with language. Uh -huh. um, but the fact is it does work. I mean, it works pretty well yeah, so um, for a lot of people anyway. When I think of communication, what I think of is I'm never truly sending you a feeling, but I'm saying words and I hope that you have some foundation by which to understand it. But I can never actually yeah. invoke a new qualia in you. So for instance, um, if I'm talking to another person and I say, um, you know, that, that the building that I saw yesterday was red. If you have never seen the color red, I can never communicate that to you. I'm hoping that you have some firsthand knowledge uh, or experience of that qualia. And if you don't, then I can't communicate to you. So like, like, yeah, that, that's what I think the, the limits of communication are. I can only invoke in you what you already have some basis of understanding of. And if you don't have it, yeah. then I can never get it. So like communicating colors to a blind person, I could never do that. Or communicating sound to a deaf person, I can never do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in education, sometimes people talk about scaffolding, but if there isn't a, if there isn't something there that you can hook things on to, then, uh -huh. then you go. So the challenge is often building the scaffolding to start with. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's all. Okay. Um, so that's got, that's given me a good definition of, of where you're coming from. Um, so my definition of a Christian, uh, what I, well, yeah. So, um, a Christian is someone who believes that, um, the basic human problem is uh, sin, so disconnection from God, uh, which then implies disconnection from others, disconnection from the environment, um, and abuse of others and abuse of the environment and so on. Um, and that um, salvation, which is a Christian jargon word, I'll, I'll just use the word freedom because that's that's a fairly good substitute for it. Uh -huh. um, there's a kind of there's a kind of in christianity there's a kind of freedom from and freedom for so um if your if your mouse if your computer mouse gets all tangled up and you talk about freeing it the understanding is that once you get it untangled freeing it from being tangled you then can use it and it can fulfill its destiny as a mouse called if i can speak nobly of such a, a plain thing sure um, and so in christianity there's this idea that the most basic unfreedom that people have is sin. So uh, Jesus famously said, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. Uh -huh. And um, then he comes to bring us freedom from sin in a couple of senses. Uh, one is that he comes to give us freedom from the, the penalty of sin um, or the judgment of sin. And the other is through a gradual process he gives us freedom from the power of sin in this life and then ultimately go to be with him in heaven. Okay. Um, freedom for bit is, um, is a kind of vision of human flourishing uh, where people live in relationships of love with each other, relationships of forgiveness and relationship of love with, with God. So that's, that's the kind of, uh, the kind of vision of life, if you like. Okay. Um, so I'm curious. Um, it's something I was thinking about this. I'm not going anywhere in particular with this, but it's just a, just an observation that I was pondering before we talk. If somebody asks me what my worldview is, I don't generally say I'm a theist. I say I'm I'm a Christian. I give you my brand of theism. Mm -hmm. If somebody asks an atheist, you know, what what are you into? They just say they're an atheist. They don't generally give a brand. Do you, do you, I wonder why that is? Um, I mean, I think it would depend on. I think it depends on the question. If somebody says like, well, what is your general worldview? And you respond with atheists, it's, it doesn't really say anything, right? Uh, but I don't know if you, if somebody asked me my worldview, I don't know if I would say atheist, but if somebody was like, oh, like, what do you believe in? I might say atheist, because usually those are like religious questions or spiritual questions. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's my guess. It, it probably just depends on the ver vernacular at the time. Like, what is somebody asking? Like, when somebody says worldview, are they talking about religion or it, what kind of conversation are you in, I guess, yeah. Hmm. I wonder whether, um, so when, when people adopt a certain religion, it usually has a, a kind of 
fairly full picture of what human life should be like. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious uh, whether maybe atheist doesn't imply a picture of human life. I know some atheism does. I know that if you're a, a hardcore Marxist or the tenet of Marxism is that you're an atheist. And mm -hmm. so if, if you were a Marxist, which I don't believe you are, um, you'd answer you were an atheist and then that would imply a whole swathe of things. Mm -hmm. So do you think your, your atheism or your spiritual outlook does imply things for other parts of your outlook in life? Um, no, I wouldn't say so. I mean, insofar as there are holes that religion could fill, my being an atheist, I guess, implies parts there. So, but, but I would say that for me, my atheism basically limits, you know, or, or defines my view towards like a higher power. Um, I do agree that a lot of people will just say they're an atheist and it seems like they haven't done much thinking about like, well, why do you do anything that you do? Or why do you exist the way that you exist? Or, you know, how do you... When you say like something is bad or good, what does that mean to you? And a lot of people just kind of don't think about those things. Yeah. Um, now, yeah. I would actually extend that and I would say almost everybody doesn't think about those things. When it comes to, um, oh man, I'm trying to trigger the absolute fuck out of you, okay? I'm trying my hardest, okay? When it comes to like views on meta ethics, my personal opinion is that these are 100% just inherited by the people around you. That most people don't actually spend time thinking about like, well, what is goodness? Um, I think it's more just you inherit these from your parents, your environment, and then you just kind of like grow up yeah. kind of with these thoughts, um, whether you're religious or not. Now, if you are religious, you might spend a little bit more time contemplating these. If you um, go to church because you're receiving like a direct kind of moral guidance, usually you'll have, um, at least I, I was raised Catholic, so like every weekend a uh, priest will talk to you and say like, hey, this is why we do this, or this is why we do that, and then they'll cite verses in the Bible and then relate it to your real life. So maybe those types of people will have thought a little bit more about it, but I think for the most part, a lot of our moral beliefs are just kind of inherited from people around us. Hmm. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Uh, inherited or, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, when you're talking about friends who are your contemporaries, perhaps I wouldn't use the word inherited, but the, you absorb them. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think that's right. I think I think you can go through life and you can test your beliefs sometimes. So you can't. I don't think anyone can claim to have completely objectively derived beliefs, but you can say that your beliefs are tested to a certain extent. You know, you've you've ask yourself hard questions you've allowed, allowed other people to ask you hard questions and all that kind of thing i think that's possible uh -huh. but i don't think it's possible to say that you, you know kind of derived everything from from scratch yourself yeah um i'd also yeah. on there's a um i'm trying not to do i do generally when i'm arguing with somebody i'll use very 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 loaded hypotheticals because they'll very quickly test the extent of like is this a valid thought or not so i'm gonna i'm gonna try to stay away from the more ultra loaded ones but an interesting question i'll ask you is you do what you're comfortable with oh okay well if you're okay well hey if you're okay with that so like um je, je, so something that i find interesting is i feel like a lot of morality is um so as a moral anti-realist, when I say morality, I mean like what we talk about is morality. I feel like a lot of it is intuitively derived. Um, and I think a lot of those intuitions uh, actually supersede so much of what somebody else might actually believe in. Um, so for example, this, this would be like a question I would challenge somebody. So maybe I find like a, a, a really big conscience, super deontological person, um, or maybe I talk to a Catholic, somebody that very much, they have read all of scripture, they believe in it. And I'll ask them, okay, a last, uh, uh, there was a lost book of Kant um, that was, you know, unearthed or, uh, you know, in the original German, they translated it. Or I'll say to, you know, like a Catholic, they found a, another book, another gospel. Um, and in this new passage um, of this system that you derive your morality from, there is a passage that says we have discovered that, um, you know, abusing children is actually good. It's actually a morally righteous thing to do. I think that when you confront people with that idea, I, I, in my personal feeling, I can't prove this, my feeling is that the vast majority of people would dump that moral system before changing their intuitive feeling about said morality, which makes me wonder sometimes um, how much of that moral system is actually like, oh, you know, I am Christian, therefore I have these beliefs, versus I have these intuitive feelings of what's right and wrong, and they happen to kind of like mirror a lot of these things, and there's like some reciprocated back and forth there. Does that make sense when I say that? Yeah, it yeah. does. It does. And in fact, I was surprised recently when I visited, um, I was back in Oxford on sabbatical and I was working with a moral philosopher. Uh -huh. And what interested me is that moral philosophers often in their arguments appeal to moral intuitions. Uh -huh. They put forward two arguments, two hypotheticals, and they presume that the reader will find one more morally persuasive and then that's a tick in, the, in their argument. So uh -huh. I think there's a lot of what you're saying there, actually. Um, whether that's always the case, 
Uh, I don't think so. I think there are some things about Christianity which fit me very comfortably and they accord with my intuitions and other things that are they're strange or uncomfortable uh -huh. um, and I continue on with them regardless. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, yeah. But I think, I think the, yeah, I think a lot of people give a lot of credence to moral intuition and a Christian might too, you know, the Christian might say that conscience is a bit of a God given thing. Uh -huh. If it's a well educated conscience, there's such a thing as a badly educated conscience. Uh -huh. So, Getting back to why you don't believe in any kind of supernatural things. Um, would you say you have a kind of scientific outlook? Um, yeah, kind of. Um, so I am, I am much more careful about this than I was like five or six or seven years ago. So m my belief, I would say, is that if I ever use these terms incorrectly, feel free to correct me because it's always better to clarify what I'm saying. Um, I believe that normativity comes way before science. So science is never going to give us answers about anything related to like morals or ethics um, or like what we ought to do or anything. So. I would say that like I'm a scientific person, but like science, I have like an instrumentalist view that science is just like a tool for learning about the world around us. Um, it's never going to tell me what I ought to believe or give me any type of philosophical insight to anything. Okay. So I'll tell you one of the weird things that I believe as a Christian going back to the last conversation, which uh -huh. I don't quite know what to make of, but it relates to this. Okay. I've always found the Trinity a very weird idea in, in, um, in Christianity, very hard to understand. Um, and yet, um, it makes sense of the observation that you just made that normativity is kind of, in some sense, really foundational to life. In fact, it makes sense of the idea of the intuition, if we're going back to people's moral intuitions. Mo a lot of people have this intuition that the most important thing in life is relationships. And that's a very powerful intuition for a lot of people. Uh -huh. And in Christianity, that makes perfect sense because in the Trinity, relationships actually preceded even the material creation. So there's a sense in which relationships are more foundational even than the material creation. And so, um, uh, and what goes along with that actually is what you said, that normativity uh, is part of relationships. In fact, I think a very, very important part of relationships is, is normativity. So, um, yeah, okay, that's interesting, that's interesting. I will so, say it's very so frustrating on that note, being an atheist, mm -hmm. and then a lot of people in the Western world are increasingly, um, like, a-religious, they, they, you know, I don't know if I say they're, they're atheists, but they don't believe in, in religious. Secular, secular is a good word, yeah. Yeah, very secular. Um, I'm sure you've heard this term before. Have you heard of the term scientism? Yes, I have. Yeah, so a lot of people, I think, unfortunately, fall into that trap of feeling like science can give us all the answers in life, rather than yeah. science is just like a, a tool by which we can make ex explorations of problems. But yeah. there, there is no normativity. Like that, that all has, to, all that work happens before we ever even begin to have a scientific process. Um, and some people, I think, fall into the trap of feeling like, oh, you know, what? I'm not religious, I'm not spiritual, I have science. And it's like, that's like saying, you know, I don't like the color red, I don't like the color blue, I like cars. It's, it's, that's like a totally different thing. They're not, they, these don't exist in the same realm, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think of science, so uh, this is a really informal definition, but uh -huh. it's flexible enough to use across a lot of different areas. Uh -huh. I think that science is kind of a a, the, the use of evidence and logic to approach questions and to get to use, use both of them together to approach questions sure. and I think that um, I get a little bit surprised and frustrated um, with atheists not necessarily you I don't know what you think about this but I find that sometimes um, atheists in their arguments against Christianity actually uh, are anti-scientific, I think, or they, they don't use evidence. So um, can I give you a couple of examples of that? Yeah, go for it. Um, so have you heard of this um, this debate about fine tuning and the multiverse? Have you heard of this? this um, yeah, so when I was 16, 17, and I began my venture into atheism, I learned all of the, um, is it, Aqu is it Aquinas or Aquinas had all the syllogisms, the teleological argument, the cosmological? So I'm familiar yeah. with these and then the rebuttals that okay. said. So I know the fine-tuning argument. You know, some people call it the, the watchmaker argument or the clockmaker argument or something. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so this this version of it that I'm thinking of is goes something like this: uh -huh. there are these physical constants that, if they were slightly different, the universe wouldn't exist, or it wouldn't exist in a form that could support life as we know it. I mean, it's a question whether life could exist in some completely different form. Uh -huh. um, but they, it goes along those lines, and then, and then, um, and then you say, well. Does this imply that um, you know that somebody has, as it were, fine-tuned the buttons to to get you the universe that you have? Uh -huh. And then there's this idea that there's a multiverse, which is that there's actually you know lots and lots of different universes, and if they're all slightly different, then um, then it's not as as it were, it's not surprising that we would find ourselves in one that is suitable for life, because if it wasn't suitable for life, we wouldn't be there to observe it, which is called the anthropic principle. Uh -huh. And I find that a strange argument because um, although it has the appearance of science, you know, it talks about funky things like a multiverse, uh -huh. actually at the crucial hurdle, which is whether there's a concern for evidence or not, there isn't a concern for evidence because as far as I know, there's no evidence that there's a multiverse. So, um, uh -huh. yeah, I, I find that a strange I find that a strange exit from evidence. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that's a that would be a, a silly rebuttal. I, the most common one that I've heard is typically um, people that make the fine tuning mm -hmm. argument have presupposed the idea that the universe only could have been the way that it is today. Therefore, it was fine tuned to be this way. But the reality is that it could have been any other number of ways. But things would just look different. But that's hard for us to conceive. Um, the, the simple example of this is um, a Christian and an atheist are walking along a, a street, it's raining outside, and they find a pothole with a puddle in it, and the Christian says, oh my God, what are the chances that the shape of the water is exactly, you know, as the pothole, like it's been tuned to be that way, and then the atheist would say, well, no, I mean, it just, it fits the pothole, that's the only way that it could be here, but if the pothole was different, potentially the pothole could be different, would be the rebuttal that I'm familiar with. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, no. Some people do jump into the multiverse. I was. I was reading. Can I read you something from the Stanford Encyclopedia of, of Philosophy? Oh man, I've spent so much time on this. Uh, this is my my favorite wiki. Yes. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's great, isn't it? I really, I really like it. It's uh, it's very well written. Uh -huh. um, on the assumption that there is a sufficiently diverse multiverse, it is neither surprising that there is at least one universe hospitable to life, nor, uh -huh. since we couldn't found ourselves in a life-hostile life universe, that we find ourselves in a life-friendly one. So it's, it is a it is a uh, an argument that's used uh -huh. this anthropic principle, but yeah. I find it strange. I, yeah, I would say that's pretty. That sounds like a pretty silly. Yeah. The other the other area is that. Um, so what's your attitude to miracle claims? Um, th so these would be, these would fall into scientific investigation. So I view science um, similar to you. So you said it was like the use of evidence or logic to approach mm. questions. No, not or, not or, not or, both. Both. That's one of the remarkable things about science, actually, that you use them both together. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, so science is like an it's like an investigatory process for me. Um, if something can't be investigated with some uh, empirical process, then I I I, 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 I wouldn't put forth any like truth claims, or I would assume it's false um, unless proven otherwise. Is how I would view it. Yeah. Okay. So you you said you were raised a Catholic, is that right? Yes, very. I went to a Jesuit high school, Catholic grade school. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So is is your understanding that Christianity uh, invites such an exploration or is your understanding that Christianity would say you just have to believe? Um, so I would say that every single church is different. <laughs> um, even within Catholicism, you'll run into some churches that are incredibly fundamentalist um, to where I'll, I'll hear things I'll hear, I'll, I'll hear within my own within my own high school, um, I will hear some father, we call them father, whatever, some Jesuits will say something along the lines of like, the universe is the way that it is, and you know, you can try to use science, but you know, God exists above that, blah, blah, blah. And then I've heard other Jesuits make arguments more similar to like the, the clockmaker argument, where it's like, yeah, science is totally legitimate, and you can investigate anything scientifically because God made it that way. God, you know, created a universe such that you can explore it, and these are the tools that he's given us to explore it. But that doesn't mean that he couldn't do something that exists outside the bounds of 
of science, or we might just not understand it yet. So I, I've heard all sorts of, I'm, I'm very careful. I'm glad that I have this background because we talk about like Islam sometimes because of stuff that goes on. And I try not to generalize all Muslims because I know that even Catholics can't be generalized, even my even in my own parish. So uh, yeah, so I, that was a really long winded way of saying, I'd be hesitant to say all Christians believe X or all Christians believe Y, because it seems like there's a big variety of thought um, or a big diversity of thought between uh, even the different sects, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I, I think, um, so one of the things that's often, uh, Christians are often accused of is is asking people just to believe without evidence. Uh-huh. Um, and I don't think that's right. So, um, you know, the story of uh, Thomas after the resurrection, Jesus comes and appears to him and says, um, Thomas doesn't believe that Jesus is there. And Jesus says, well, you know, you can look at my hands uh, because you have, um, because you have seen and believed, blessed are those who haven't seen and believe. Uh-huh. And people take that to mean that um, Jesus is asking Thomas and by inference us to believe things without any any reason to believe them. Uh-huh. Um, but I don't think that's right because Thomas had actually seen a lot already of Jesus and the, the Gospel of John where that's written then goes on and says um, the reason why all these miracles have been written down is so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and have life in his name. So I think there is a, um, a willingness in Christianity uh, to look at evidence and to, and to evaluate evidence up to a point. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think that, yeah. is, that is the case. Yeah. So, so as an atheist or as an agnostic, what do you think about Jesus' resurrection from the dead? Um, I mean, obviously, I think it didn't really happen. <laughs> um, yeah. Sure. Uh, I know that historians debate. I, I think most historians believe Jesus was a real person. Um, most secular historians, although I think there's even some debate about that. But I, in terms of like a resurrection, I don't believe obviously that that ever happened. Yeah. Uh, I think I think that's a bit wrong. I think that uh, well, I, don't, I don't agree with you about the resurrection, but of course, but what you said is generally believed by scholars. I think that is a bit wrong. My that Jesus was a real person. Well, my understanding is that scholars, yes, certainly serious ancient history scholars believe that. Mm-hmm. So um, I was looking at a book which sort of looked over all the scholarship of Jesus, and it it made um, the fo- it made it made the following claim that scholars of all variety, that's to say, Christian, Jewish, or um, or atheist. Um, and others in between, uh-huh. they all believe a number of things, not completely without exception, but there's an overwhelming consensus on a number of things, that Jesus was was a real person. He uh-huh. was killed by crucifixion. Um, soon after he died, the disciples had experiences that led them to believe that he was alive. Um, then Paul of Tarsus, um, uh, who was the Apostle Paul who wrote a lot of the New Testament, had, ex- had an experience which convinced him that Jesus was alive. Uh-huh. And then he went around the Roman world preaching and stuff. And that not, not as many scholars, but a lot of them believe that Jesus' tomb was empty. Sure. So yeah. I'd, I'd say that's, that's a more accurate representation of what scholars in the field of ancient history think. Okay. So, yeah. So, so then the question is, you know, what, what do you make of all that? Um, how, how do you explain all those facts and that kind of thing? Um, and actually, um, the other thing that I don't think a lot of people are aware of is just how strong the New Testament is historically. So um, people, you know, tend to look at all ancient history and think it's all as good or not as each other, but that's not actually right. Um, so can I show you a graphic here? Yeah, go for it. So this is a um, this is a chart which shows a bunch of ancient history documents uh-huh. the black dot and the red dots leading to it show how far it is between when the document was originally written uh-huh. and the existing copies that we have and then the, the area of the circles represents the number of existing copies that we have so for homer for example we've got a time gap of 400 years and we've got about 2,000 copies or something like Herodotus. Um, we've got a time gap of over 1,000 years 
and 100 roughly copies. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, when it comes to the New Testament, um, we have a lot more copies and they're much closer to the uh, dates of the original documents. And why that's important um, is that, it, well, first of all, why did it happen? It happened because um, as a religious text, the New Testament was copied and copied and copied and sent all around the world. So that's why there's so much copying going on. Mm -hmm. That's why it happened. And why that's useful is because there's a process called textual criticism, which means that if you have thousands of documents across a huge area, and then in one tiny area, you've got a variant reading, then you can make a scientific guess that there's a maybe a copying error or something like that that got into that variant reading. So you can, as it were, try and work back to the original text. Uh -huh. And so what this says, it doesn't say that what is said in the documents is true. I mean, you could have a, a copy of, um, uh, of a Harry Potter book that was you know written a, a few years before and wouldn't prove that what was written in it was true. Uh -huh. But what it does tell you is that the documents that we have are very close to um, the original copies, where what was originally written. So this so is that's... something where, um, oh man, it's been a long time since I've been in school. So you'll have to forgive, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not ready to do like a religious biblical debate, but I'd be curious how, um, I'd be curious what the definition is here of copies. Um, and I'd be a little critical, especially when you say something like the original documents. Um, so if we're going to talk about the books of the New Testament, for instance, um, there, there's two interesting things here. So one is that um, there have been multiple councils to figure out which books exactly would be included in the New Testament, right? Um, was it the Council of Nicaea or is this a different one? Mm -hmm. Nicaea, okay. right. Yeah, where, where we're deciding which books are going to be in the New Testament. And then you also have a problem where... Um, I don't believe some original documents have been found. So of the four gospels that we talk about now, um, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. My understanding is that Matthew, and Mar Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all written in such a way that I believe it's called the Q document, where religious scholars believe that there is some, there was some originating document that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were based on. And then if you've read the four gospels, John is much different in that the writing tends to be much more, I don't know if you'd say poetic or something, but I, but I don't yeah. believe that Q document that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are believed to have been based on has ever been located. Um, am I wrong on that or am I misremembering maybe? No, no, that's, that's, that's I've, I've heard that mm -hmm. hypothesis. So the first three documents are called the Synoptic Gospels. Mm -hmm. And there is evidence because they've got some common material. There's evidence that there was a preceding document yeah. uh, that they, which is actually uh, in, in one, I mean, what you make of that is, is, uh, is interesting because it actually shows that there's a preceding document even closer to the events. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear that that's a, that's a problem. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. I was just, I was curious in terms of how we use the word like, um, like uh, like copies or original documents or whatever just i'm yeah, curious. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a fair that's a fair comment and and i haven't been able to check that i've put on the bottom of that um a link to a to an article that talks about it so uh one can chase that through sure. but i believe that the overall impression uh, and the other thing that i did check was i checked that the other ancient history documents that were referred to were calculated on the same basis mm -hmm. so so if the big red circles uh, include both full manuscripts and partial manuscripts, I checked that the yellow circles of the other documents were made on the same basis and I received gotcha, gotcha. that they... Yeah, okay. Is that it's a fair comparison. Uh -huh. so, so I think there's no controversy in the general proposition that the documents are written much closer to the originals and that there are more of them. Uh -huh. Sure. So, so that's um, that's kind of important because it means that when someone reads the Bible, they look. Not, uh, I, I should be careful here. When someone reads the New Testament, mm -hmm. they're looking at something very close to what was originally written. Sure. Now, as a Christian, I would go further and say that God made sure what was written was what He wanted. But you don't have to take that step. You don't have to invoke anything supernatural to say that the documents are pretty close to what was originally written. Mm -hmm. And they're also, they're also intriguing documents because they, they pass something called the embarrassment test. The embarrassment test is that um, they say things that if they were made up, you'd wonder why people would put them in. 
So they have a kind of historical roughness about them. Mm -hmm. um, some people might find unpalatable, um, but it could be a sign that they're actually real history because they've got a few weird things in them. So for example, the early Christian leaders are uh, treated very badly in the documents sometimes. They come across very, very badly. Mm -hmm. So it's not, some people say the New Testament documents were written to be propaganda for the early church leaders. Well, they're very bad propaganda because they come across really badly. You know, Peter denies Jesus, um, that they say and do embarrassing things. Mm -hmm. And the other thing which is really strange um, for people of modern times to understand, but it is there, is that the first witnesses to the resurrection were women. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't strike us as remarkable at all, but it is remarkable in the day because, unfortunately, at that stage, women's testimony was not accepted in court. Mm -hmm. So that was a very strange thing to write in a document if you were trying to, you know, just trying to uh, make it seem plausible. Sure. It's, it's, mm. So um, if these documents were what was originally written and we have a range of um, uh, evidences that that something amazing happened, people genuinely believed Jesus had appeared to them and that began Christianity. You know, the question is, if if you're a secularist, what, what do you think happened? So <clears throat> I have my own litmus test um, for a lot of these types of things. And uh, it's something that I notice, and I'm lucky that, well, we're both like, I guess, and that we, we lived through this transitionary period. Something that I noticed growing up is it feels like there are so many less sightings of Bigfoot, UFOs, and like miracles now that everybody has a cell phone. I noticed that. Um, I would have expected that as more people get access to technology to make recordings, now we can document what's going on around us even better. Um, maybe these things will show up even more, but it feels like suspicious, suspiciously, they've almost completely disappeared. Or maybe just as what I was involved in. When I was growing up, Bigfoot was like, that was some real shit. Like, depending on where you went, you might run into them, you know? Or UFO sightings were like big things growing up to me. Um, but then as I've grown up and stuff, once it's become more popular, like, nobody's posting, you know, Bigfoot footage from their Galaxy, you know, S11 or their iPhone, you know, 13. It doesn't seem to happen. I, there could have been any number of things that happened uh, a long time ago. Uh, if you're being honest, you don't even have to say that, like, the original writers of these texts were lying um that they were trying to fabricate something it might be that you know a body might have been moved something might have been miscommunicated um, any of these things could have happened um a, a lot of historical documents it's a huge effort to try to put together like what actually happened for some things um yeah i i, I guess i i don't know there, there could have been a large number of things that would happen but when it comes to defining and like an omnipresent omniscient god that is supposed to be woven into the fabric of every part of the universe's existence. I find it a little, I find it wholly unconvincing when arguments have to go back to, well, look what happened 2000 years ago. Like maybe there was this or that. And it's like, yeah, maybe. But I mean, a lot of historical documents over this time period and, and beyond and later, um, even medieval, you know, time periods can be argued about or debated about. Um, I don't know what happened. I can't pretend to know what happened, but I don't think there will ever be an argument from that time period that would convince me otherwise to be a religious person, I guess I would say. Hmm. You've raised a lot of arguments there. I think we both agree fundamentally on the non-existence of Bigfoot, so that's a, that's a victory. Sure. Uh -huh. um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I guess it comes down to how you, how you view life in a way. Look, um, truths are offered to us in life, in life on particular terms. And it's, I guess, up to us to investigate them on those terms. So, so if someone is a, um, if someone's a physicist and they're really good at investigating the existence of Higgs boson and they, and they can work and they can do that. Uh -huh. um, if you ask them, uh, is this, uh, this book here a great work of literature? Um, they might be a bit flummoxed because they're not used, they don't have criteria for investigating that in their head. Or if you take them into a courtroom and say, look, here's a here's a, a case unfolding before you, do you think this person's guilty or innocent? And they have to weigh evidence. Uh -huh. Actually, they have to do something very similar to what we have to do when we look at the New Testament. Uh -huh. And they might, he might say, well, look, I, I just do particle physics. So, um, so I wanna take this into this, I wanna take my methodology into this arena. Uh -huh. um, that's not really okay, I don't think. I, I think that, um, 
someone who's a wise person takes investigates things on their own terms investigates things on the terms that they're investigating if that makes sense mm -hmm. so um christianity is offered to the world as truth on the basis of historical testimony and i think that's that's the option that we have if we want to investigate truth seriously we have to enter it on its own terms i know i know christianity makes a, a lot of claims about a lot of things and so i can understand people sort of approaching it from a different way but if that's if that's the way that's offered to us um surely you have to enter the methodology and, and look at it that way yeah i mean but out i think oh sorry go ahead. are you ruling that approach out you're saying well i'd never i'd never believe anything on the basis of history this seems what i'm hearing anyway never believe anything i might believe historical events on the basis of history but um not, not modern phenomena no i don't think so um if you were to present any modern phenomenon to me i wouldn't accept that in the past these things were definitely happening we can't seem to prove that now but it did happen before i think i would demand a more recent or or be able to produce like at that moment in time like well here's evidence of this particular thing if somebody gave me a book and said well gravity you know newton you know dropped 400 apples and we always saw gravity over and over again but we can't see gravity anymore i would say okay well I, I feel like i'm more likely to have an issue with the historical documentation there than to just say oh well i agree with that we'll figure out some new way in the future to replicate his you know findings that gravity is a thing um yeah, so I mean, like historical testimony might be interesting in terms of exploring history, but I, I don't know if I would, I don't know if I would change my entire current worldview, especially because I'd have to dive into the historical testimony behind every single religion. Because I'm sure, um, I'm sure that I'm sure that everybody, I'm sure Hindus, Muslims, uh, Jewish people, all have their own versions of historical events as well. I don't know what the authenticity of all of their you know religious texts are, plus any other religion I haven't heard of. Yeah, you know? I think I'd just be more interested in like, well, what is our modern day? What can I point to right now to give me, uh, you know, some clear understanding of the existence of some higher power? Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know what I think about that. I guess uh, reality is what it is and evidence is offered to us as it is. And, and we have to make the best sense of that that we can. I can't see myself a logical difficulty with um uh going from a historical event in the past to to impact my worldview I, I don't i don't understand what the logical problem with that is i mean when when does it stop Do you, if if something's two weeks ago is it is it admissible for you is it if it's a century ago is it admissible for you is it 500 years ago? when's the magic date when, yeah so when you my when you modern, yeah so modern i coming? I think the general assumption that physicists make, um, and philosophers, I, I would assume in general, make um, is that um, things like logics or um, our fundamental understanding of the universe is consistent throughout all of time and all of space. Uh, if something works in one way in one area, it ought to work another the, the exact same way in another area. So um, historical evidence is just nothing that, like, if, histor if, if I'm considering historical evidence, it's not so much that I'm considering historical evidence, it's more that that's evidence of something that will continue to function that way presently. So if I read something and it's like, oh, well, here's evidence that this particular chemical reaction happened two months ago, my reading of that isn't that, oh, wow, that's a historical event that happened two months ago. It's more, oh, wow, that establishes that particular fact that is true to this day, that I could rerun that same experiment and have the same result, or I could rerun the same trial and get the same outcome, essentially. Hmm. I guess if I ask like a more pointed question related to this is um, my if I was if I was asking a more like a, a aggressive or accusatory question, my question would be like, so there was evidence of miraculous or crazy stuff happening 2000 years ago. Um, at what point does that become irrelevant for you if it doesn't seem to be the case that we can see any of that today? Like what if instead of the year 2000 AD, um, what if we were in the year 4,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 and we were still reading about Jesus coming 20,000 years ago and he hasn't showed up again yet and it doesn't seem like we're seeing any of the miracles or anything that were talked about so much in the New and Old Testament. Like at what point is it too long for you, I guess? Well, I don't think, I don't think there, is a, there is a used by date for me because um, uh, actually biblical Christianity is, 
is close to your worldview in saying that um, miracles are infrequent. So if mm -hmm. you look over the whole span of the Bible, mm -hmm. there's three uh, periods where there are big miracle claims. The first is the Exodus when Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. The second is Michael Elijah in the end of the um, kingdom of Israel. And the third is Jesus. And so there are, as it were, lots and lots of miracles claimed in those periods. But then there's spans of thousands of years where where God is uh, said to be working providentially, working through the ordinary processes of the world. And so the miracles are not, it's not as though there's sort of a miracle every five minutes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, there's not a miracle every five minutes in my life, but nor is there one in the biblical record. Mm -hmm. So, um, so no, I don't think that there is, I don't think that's a claim of Christianity that there are, um, there's, there's claims, there's the possibility of that, but the possibility does not imply that it actually happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Do you I think... Mean, oh, go ahead. You go. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, let's say that theoretically tomorrow there was some massive excavation done um, and there was a treasure trove of documents that was uncovered that shows that the testimony of the original women that um, saw the empty tomb or whatever was false. Basically, we'll just say documents come out and they, they verifiably prove that the story of Jesus Christ wasn't true. Does that mean that assuming that you read these documents, you audit them and they end up being authentic, does your entire worldview change immediately at that point because of the, because of the erasure of that history or? Absolutely. Absolutely, it would. Gotcha. Yeah. So another question that I would ask in that vein is, do you believe that, um, do you think that the Christian God makes any sort of modern day intervention into the world? Or do you take the approach more that he just kind of like sits back and watches everything happen and anything he influences is going to be um, pre or post existence of a human, like after death or before death or whatever? Yeah, I do think that uh, God is actively involved in, in the world and creation all the time. So I'm not uh, I think the view you were talking about there is called deism, that God sort of sets up the clock and winds it up and, and off it runs. Uh -huh. No, I do believe God is active in the world um, through what you might call regular and irregular activity. So the regular activity is what people sometimes call the, the laws of nature, uh -huh. um, and the irregular activity would be miracles, which I don't rule out, uh -huh. um, but, um, you know, they're, they're infrequent. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my position that God is. And, and Christians believe that um, when you become a Christian, you have the presence of God with you in the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit guides you and helps you understand things, helps you to live as God wants you to. So I do believe God's active in the world, uh -huh. um, but that's not the same thing as saying, I believe that there are extraordinary miracles all the time. What is, so if we can't ever measure or verify in an empirical sense, that God is active in the world, how do you, or maybe you believe that, and then if you don't, which I assume you wouldn't, how do you have a understanding that God is making interventions in the world? Um, like, epistemically, like, how do you say that, like, oh, like, this must be a thing that happens? Like, yeah, how, how does that, yeah, how does that happen? Um, well, I, so it's a subjective and objective here. So I could talk about how, um, uh, we're going back to the beginning of the conversation, it is quite difficult to, to, um, ask people to accept your subjective experience although i could i could talk about that and i'm happy to talk about that uh -huh. um but the objective part is that god has acted decisively in history so it's offered to us on those terms i mean i, I i'm i want to go back a little bit to the resurrection of jesus yeah. just for a second uh -huh. um because it sounded as though you were you were appealing to something called hume's argument have you heard of this so hume hume had an argument which said David Hume had an argument which said that a, a miracle is a violation of a law of nature. Um, it's the most improbable of all events. So therefore, if you hear a miracle claim, it's it's probably false. Um, now, that's one reading of Hume. Um, but it seems to me that a lot of people use that kind of argument. Mm -hmm. And here's the irony. Um, I think that has the appearance of science, probably because it, it appeals to a law of nature or something like that. But actually, it's used as an escape from evidence. So somebody uses an argument like that and says, well, I'm not really going to take the evidence seriously here. Um, well, that seems to me to be a betrayal of science. So I find it ironic that that's how scientific people 
uh, talk about miracles. And actually, um, um, I'm not saying that you would use that argument, mm -hmm. but some people do. Um, and there's a very interesting um, um, mathematical formula. Have you heard of Bayes' rule? Uh, at some point, but you're going to have to refresh my mind. That's all right. So Bayes' rule is a way of, um, of taking an initial strength of belief, mm -hmm. um, saying or about anything active, say two weeks ago, there's a, there's a forecast for the next two weeks about what the weather's going to do. Mm -hmm. And it, it, and it might've given a strength of belief. It was going to rain today of 10%. But then oh, this is like Bayesian probability kind of, so yeah, you're constantly right. adjusting your prior based yeah, on new information. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right, right. So okay. you have this problem and then it rains yesterday mm -hmm. and because it rained yesterday, they update the, the prior belief that they had about probably of rain today and it goes up because mm -hmm. it rained yesterday. So um, it's a fact about Bayes' rule that if you start out with a prior of um, 100%, then you end up with 100% regardless of what the evidence says. It's just how the math works out. That if you have a strong enough prior of 100%, it gets you 100% regardless of the evidence. And that's the accusation that's sometimes made of Christians. Mm -hmm. So um, my, um, I can read a Richard Dawkins quote, which is great. Um, passion for passion, an evangelical Christian and I may be evenly matched, but we're not equally fundamentalist. The true scientist, however passionately he may believe in evolution, for example, knows exactly what would change his mind, evidence, the fundamentalist knows that nothing ever will change his mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so the claim being made there is that the fundamentalist starts out with a belief in miracles, and then, as it were, according to Bayes' rule, doesn't matter what the evidence comes up, you still end up with 100% belief in miracles. Mm -hmm. But my concern is that Bayes' rule also has the property that if you start with a zero, it doesn't matter what the evidence says, you end up with zero. Sure. And my my concern is that Hume's argument works like that as well, that people um, have this mindset of just not looking at evidence. They, they dismiss it a priori, and that doesn't seem very scientific. And yeah. maybe it's not important to be scientific about this question, but you ought to say that, I think, I'm just not scientific about this, or I don't care about evidence. Sure, so, okay. So I would quibble over some of the terms we're using here and I would redefine things and I think this would fit better in, in, into my worldview. So if somebody tells me something and that thing that they tell me seems to be highly unlikely, um, I'm probably going to err on the side of what I already know to be true unless given actual evidence otherwise. Now, when you use the term, people will disregard evidence because it doesn't... Um, comply or comport with whatever priors you have, uh, I would argue that the first word you're using, evidence, I would say that that word is incorrect. Um, instead of evidence, what we have is a claim. And I think that, that is substantially different than evidence. Um, so for example, if somebody makes a claim of a miraculous event, but then doesn't provide evidence, um, given my materialistic or physicalist understanding of the, the world, the universe, I'm going to err on the side of this thing probably didn't happen. Uh, can, I, if, can I just stop you there for a yeah, second? Go for just it. I want yeah, go for it. This is just a, mm -hmm. we do this in seminars as academics. We stop people for clarification, but not questions. I do it all the time. So yeah, go for it. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so the distinction you were making between claim and evidence there mm -hmm sounded to me a little bit like the distinction between belief and knowledge so belief is just what you what you believe okay whereas knowledge is belief that has warrant it's it's kind of it's kind of got something backing it up sure were you is that the kind of distinction you're making between a claim and evidence the claim is just a claim it doesn't have anything backing it up but evidence is sort of more solid is that what you meant yeah i think so so like a claim would be somebody says something is just a claim, yeah. it's a statement, but evidence is here is some piece of information that appears to justify the said belief, yeah. And, and and what is the distinction between those two, just so I'm clear on this, that in the first one, it's a person speaking, whereas the evidence has to be something physical, tangible. What, what's the distinction you're making here? Um, so a 
Um, why, why is someone saying something counts as evidence? It does in law. What, what, where are we going with this? In, in a law court, somebody just, say, just saying something, might, the whole thing might, might hang on somebody just um, saying something. Yeah, hold on. Let me think about this for a second. Um, so somebody saying something like witness testimony yeah. could be a claim, but it could also be evidence but I still think that those are two distinct things. So for instance, somebody could make the claim, I saw John kill Jane, um, but for it to be evidence, he would have actually needed to have seen John kill Jane. Um, there, there are distinctly two separate things happening, even though they seem to be the same thing. The claim is just a statement, but the evidence would be some sort of fact that I could deductively or inductively or abductively arrive at a conclusion for. So somebody walking in, so let's say for instance, we have two people. Let's say one person walks in and they say, hey, um, yesterday in Baghdad, I saw John kill Jane. And let's say that I know this person yesterday was in New York City. It's like, okay, well, that's, that doesn't tell me anything. And then let's say somebody from Baghdad says, hey, yesterday I saw John kill Jane. Both of these people are making the same claim, but one seems more likely to be able to provide evidence for the claim, even though it seems those two things are the same thing. I would still say they're different. I, I would say that a claim of something and evidence of something are two distinctly separate things, although a claim and evidence can appear to be the same thing. I don't know if that was highly convoluted. Does that make sense? Uh, it sounds to me like the methodology of weighing testimony and it sounds like in the example you gave anyway, that one of them was eyewitness testimony, which was plausible because the person was in the city and another one, it wasn't plausible. Uh -huh. It sounds like, it sounds like you're talking about, I guess it's a legal methodology of a, not illegal. Uh -huh. It sounds like legal methodology about how you weigh something up in a, in a courtroom sort of. Uh -huh. I guess maybe, um, if I go back to your example, then if you, if the claim the person is making is something that they saw directly, then I guess in that case, it could count as evidence. Sure. Um, but again, there are other ways that, 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 then I would have to evaluate the reliability of that evidence. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I guess, I guess I assume that like the original claim you made might've been like, Hey, um, I saw God moved a mountain and then I would go and check and the mountain hasn't moved. But if your claim is something more personal then that claim itself would have to be evidence because it's something they've personally witnessed, like a divine revelation or something like that. And then I would have to evaluate the likelihood of that evidence. Maybe it might be, is that okay. perfect? Okay. So, okay. So backing up then. So in terms of what I was saying, um, I reject the idea that um, it is unscientific to reject certain claims when the evidence is either incredibly weak or unable to be evaluated. I think I'll always err on the side of what do we have that we already know to be true? If this doesn't comport with what we know to be true and it would require me to change, like say, a model that I have of the universe, I'm probably gonna err on the side of my model unless you can reproduce something that shows me the model is broken. Um, I think a really good example of this is um, I'll borrow from physics here. Um, in the Large Hadron Collider, uh, there was a measurement one time that a neutrino had been captured traveling faster than the speed of light. And that measurement completely breaks everything that we understand about physics. Mm -hmm. you, you can't move faster than, than C. It's not possible. Um, mm -hmm. Such that people were theorizing that it was more likely that that neutrino traveled through time than that it actually had gone faster than the speed of light. And so that claim that had been made that like, oh look, it traveled faster than light. I think it's okay to err on the side of, okay, well, hold on. I don't think that's possible because you can rerun that experiment. And then when they did rerun it, they're like, oh, okay, it wasn't the, the instrument wasn't calibrated correctly. Now contrast that with a claim that um, there are weird things that happen relativistically that make it so that Newton's understanding of the fabric of the universe doesn't quite explain things that happen in very, very large cases or very small cases. Thus, it necessitates the like need for space, time, and relativity. This is something where a claim is brought up, it breaks our model. We're probably gonna rely on our previous model, but then when we test over and over and over again, we see, okay, well, wait, hold on. Now we need to readjust our model. Um, I would argue that those are scientific ways to go about readjusting models. An individual making a claim with with iffy evidence isn't a reason for me to change my whole worldview. But if somebody makes a claim with decent evidence and then through reproducibility, we see, okay, yeah, this isn't working with what I thought before. That's what would change my mind over something. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, it does. Okay. It does. But it's just that, it's just that you said that um, uh, if somebody comes up with evidence which is weak or unable to be evaluated, mm-hmm. then that's a good reason for changing your worldview. And that's fair enough. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. Um, but there is in method, there is in in history and in the courtroom, there is a methodology for weighing human testimony that, that exists, right? People have to make decisions about trials. People have to make judgments in history. True. And so there is a methodology for that. Mm-hmm. And, and so using those methodologies, you can... Um, you can decide whether something has weak evidence or whether whether it can be that or, or and you can evaluate evidence i mean that's that's what yeah. happens all the time that's what yeah but so what i would yeah what i would the, the, so the 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 issue i would take there is there is a methodology for evaluating human testimony in a courtroom however no human testimony in a courtroom necessitates me to change my view of the world. Every claim that's going to be made by human testimony in a courtroom is going to be something that generally comports with my understanding of reality. We're going to be arguing over who was where, who killed who, who was driving what vehicle. These are all things that I, in my physicalist, materialist understanding of the universe, can understand, whether I agree or disagree about the fact of the matter. But if they were to start to make, uh, or yeah, I'll, I'll say that. But I don't think that saying that we can, like, figure out between two like we're discerning you know we're trying to figure out what actually happened everything that is talked about in trial in in human testimony squarely exists within my bubble of the understanding of the world it's not testimony of the supernatural i would say that it's uh, markedly different yeah yeah so there's a question there about whether if we're talking about bayes rule Mm -hmm. about whether someone like you uh, would assign a low probability to a miracle mm-hmm. and then need a substantial amount of evidence to change their mind about it or whether you'd assign a zero probability to it. Now, you can assign a zero probability to it. That's, that's you know, people do. Um, it comes at the cost of saying, I don't care about evidence. Mm-hmm. I don't care about historical evidence when it comes to changing my worldview. Uh, you can do that, um, but... That seems to me to be breaking, um, I guess, yeah, it seems to me to be not investigating the world on the terms in which the world presents itself to us. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, it's very much a closed universe. I mean, let me put this to you. Let me put this, let me put it this way to you. Mm -hmm. What would happen if you took the humility that you espoused when you said, I'm not an atheist, Mm-hmm. something like an agnostic, we, we can talk about the term, mm-hmm. what would happen if you took that humility to this issue of miracles? Um, the, reason I mean, said, okay. the reason you said you weren't an atheist was because you said, I can't know everything about the universe at all times and places, mm-hmm. and I'm very suspicious of such an absolute claim. So, so that sounded to me like humility. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I would start with a with a with a prior of zero percent for the existence of miracles, but given there are other explanations for things, in the absence of solid evidence, I'm probably going to believe in what I am more likely to know to be true. Um, do you have any children? I do. Okay, I have a ten year old son, and I'm sure, without even asking you, I know you've heard extraordinary stories about you walk into a room and either cookies have been eaten or something has been played with that wasn't supposed to have been played with or whatever, and the, the, our, our, um, our testimony begins um, from our children of, well, hold on, that wasn't me. It was like that yesterday. Somebody must have been in the house and did it. I don't know what happened. Um, so, like, did you wash your hands in the bathroom? Of course. The sink is completely dry. Are you sure? Well, I, all the water was on my hand. I didn't get any in the sink, right? I heard a million of these stories. Now, you could do i have like a bayesian probability of zero is my prior zero percent to believe in a miracle i mean no there could be but i'm probably going to err on the side of my child is probably lying to me because he doesn't want to get in trouble and i'm going to believe that um absent any extraordinary um evidence that supports the claim of i did wash my hands and all the water got on my hands and none of it got in the sink at all and that's what happened would be how i would view that i guess i mean what, what's interesting in this conversation to me uh-huh. um is that when we talk about this, you 
jump to other analogies and talk to other talk about other things, but we don't actually talk about the evidence for the issue at hand, which is with whether Jesus rose from the dead, which sounds to me like that in principle, um, you, yeah, in principle, you say you don't have a zero prior probability, but I, I wonder whether that's true. So I guess my thing would be, is that like, if I, the problem is that, um, I'll apply, I'm sure you've heard this, uh, it's a little bit of a derogatory term, but have you heard of the term God of the gaps? Yeah. The expression that God exists in these gaps that maybe there are explanations, maybe they aren't, but he kind of wedges his way. That, I guess my issue is that most miracles seem to be those types of things. So a miracle might be like somebody recovered from a disease that they're incredibly unlikely to recover from. And it's like, well, was that a miracle or was it just a very unlikely recovery? Um, you know, if it was the case that a religious person, um, well, for instance, um, watching Moses part uh, the Red Sea, that would be a miracle because, or watching, um, you know, somebody goes to shoot a bullet and it stops in front of a religious person in midair and then it falls to the ground like near the middle, right? These are miracles. Have you seen Pulp Fiction? Yeah, wait, I have seen Pulp Fiction. Oh, yeah, Pulp Fiction. So that wouldn't be a miracle. I wouldn't consider that a miracle, even though he, the yeah, character, interprets it as such. Everybody and they survive, and then they spend the rest of the movie arguing about the existence of God. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. But that would be, I would. I feel like that's a, that's a very good analogy to what it feels like Christians would say, oh, well, this was obvious, obviously miraculous. And it's like, was it miraculous or just highly improbable? Because highly improbable does not make a miracle. Um, that's my issue is that most mir miraculous things seem to be like a healing or a curing. And it's not something that is a 0% chance, just really unlikely, but there are more reasonable explanations um, for what happened than to just say that, well, it was some divine intervention, I guess. Okay, so so look, I, I'd put forward two criteria mm -hmm. for taking a miracle claim seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, the first criteria would be that um, the evidence that you see is what you would expect if the miracle actually happened. Mm -hmm. And the second criteria is that it's it's difficult to come up with a naturalistic explanation. Sure. Those would be two criteria, and you can get them from Bayes' rule, you know, if I read them. I would, I, would, so, I would actually, in terms of the difficulty of a miracle, um, maybe this becomes more epistemic. So my problem is that I would say... I think a miracle necessarily breaks causality. Do you disagree with that, or do I need to expand on that more? Um, I'm smiling because, um, so Hume said okay. that um, miracles uh, are a violation of the law of nature, but it was a very strange thing for him to say because he didn't believe in, he's famous for being a skeptic about causality. Oh, you're skeptical he's about causality. Interesting. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. And he, was, he was a skeptic about induction as well. He said that uh, just because the sun has risen every morning in your life, that's no grounds for thinking it's going to rise the next day. Okay. So it's quite strange for, to refer to miracles as a violation of the laws of nature because it's not very clear what he thought the laws of nature were. Gotcha. Anyway, keep going. Wait, did anybody make fun of him? Because you live your life inductively. Nobody to, not, to pretend otherwise is absurd, right? Did anybody make bully him for that? Or <laughs> well, well, it's it's a bit harder than it sounds actually uh -huh. because you say. Well, uh, Hume, you're crazy, you know. How, we all live our life this way. Mm -hmm. And then he would say, okay, you're saying to me that the reason why induction is a, is a good guide is because it's worked very well in the past for you. And that's also an inductive and induction. Argument. Yeah, it is. So he's, he was very clever. And uh, yes, people did try and make fun of him. Um, they also made fun of his argument of miracles, by the way, because... Um, his idea of probability mm -hmm. was that um, a miracle is effectively infinitely infrequent, so it's very low probability, mm -hmm. but that makes all unique historical events impossible as well. So, you know, what is the probability that a guy called Adolf shoots his girlfriend, Eva, when the Russians are three blocks away and, and kills his dog, Blondie, in 1945? Are you kidding me? All the, these things, the likelihood they'll come together is zero. Mm -hmm. So his ideas of probability... Have also been um, have criticized. Also been crit Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so I guess so. The way that I would view it is no. Yeah, yeah. you're good. Um, I, I would call myself strictly deterministic when it comes to how things function in the world because uh, I'm a big believer in causality. So every event that happens was always going to happen that exact way due to prior causes, um, and it could never be another way. Uh, a miracle implies a divine intervention where divine intervention is something extra physical or outside of our material world and 
that would it seems necessarily then that to do something like that would break the causality that exists in this internal like materialistic world. So to give the prior example, um, if somebody were to shoot a bullet at somebody and somebody were to stop that bullet in midair because of a divine intervention, causality has been broken because a force has been applied against that bullet that there was no physical reason for that force to have been applied. The causality is in a sense broken there. Um, yeah, do, do you, but maybe maybe you don't have a problem with that. Maybe like, oh yeah, causality can be broken because that's something that exists within our world and uh, somebody extra outside of that world could step in and break that or something maybe. Yes. Now this reminds me of something. Let me see if I can recover it. Um, um, yeah, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said that if you um, if you go to your drawer and uh, you leave your money there and you open it and it's gone, it's it's um, that you you can continue on as though. Uh, you can continue on from that point, even though somebody's taken the money and stolen it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make the whole world fall apart. So, an outside intervention. Um, people who believe in miracles don't believe that the world is chaos, mm -hmm. and that once a miracle occurs, you know the laws of nature are broken irrevocably. They can just continue on from, from as it were, where they were before. So, yes, I think God can do that. Um, yeah, I do think that, and it doesn't. It doesn't imply that what we all observe most of the time is is causality i'm fascinated that you think that though because um uh modern science and physics is kind of away from that that idea it's probabilistic um but that's a completely separate conversation you know you talk about things always happen exactly inevitably that's i think a little bit uh different to the way that modern physics is the world probabilistically Maybe, i know that uh, that's got yeah they might get into my so my understanding of that is that um like quantum mechanics might be probabil probabilistic in terms of determining like the exact location of a particular thing, but I believe it's still based on causality. Like I don't think, but, but that is getting a little bit outside of my, I, I don't think that people that believe in QM um, say things like, oh yeah, causality is broken. Uh, more just that like um, you can't know like the exact location and velocity of something because to find out one breaks the other. Or like we, we speak in terms of like wave functions, like there's a higher probability of something being here and it decreases there. But now that causality is broken would be my understanding of it. Yeah, I, it's, it's way beyond my field as well, but sure, I, okay. I gather it's got to do with the, um, the difficulty of reconciling quantum mechanics with much larger scale phenomena when larger scale phenomena seem causality seems to work very well and in quantum mechanics it's it's a bit murkier um, sure but, um, um okay i anyway, so back yeah to, um, back to um what we're talking about with miracles mm -hmm. um what here, I mean, so it's sound here here's a question oh. actually well here so here i'll ask a personal question for me okay so let's assume that i am of rational mind um, let's assume that my priors are not 0% for mir miraculous things, um, yeah. and I am open to it. Let's say that I'm a reasonable person, I don't have any divine revelation personally, and I haven't personally um, observed any miracles. Um, who am I to say then that, like, well, maybe somebody else's testimony is valid for a miracle when so many people across so many religions have so much of this miraculous testimony? Like, why would me as a reasonable person become religious because I'm, like, how would I even select for some testimony over the other? Well, I guess my response is um, it, it, you proceed on a case by case basis. It's, there are so many areas in life where there are many, many claims. And if you just stop because there are so many claims, you don't get anywhere. Um, so you just investigate on a case by case basis. And so in the case of um, the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus, um, there is not a, um, um, so, so let me, let me give you, um, let me let me give a, a little illustration here. Uh -huh. Supposing I said that miraculously the world appeared five minutes ago with the appearance of age. Sure. Now that is a miracle claim. Yeah. That if it is true, then you would expect to see everything that you see. There's no problem with it there. If uh -huh. the miracle occurred, the evidence is what you would expect. The trouble is that there are perfectly reasonable um nat well, it doesn't matter whether nat naturalistic or not, but there are uh -huh. perfectly reasonable other explanations, namely that the world did exist more than five minutes ago, that gave you the evidence. So that's a, a weak sort of miracle claim. So what a strong miracle claim is one where the evidence is what you would expect, but also it's hard to find naturalistic explanations. And I can tell you 
that um, scholars really struggle to come up with an alternative explanation for the evidence surrounding um, the events after Jesus' life. So there's a bunch of theories. They argue between themselves and no one theory has gained universal prominence. So there's, there's a theory that the disciples stole the body. Uh -huh. um, the problem with that is it doesn't take, take account of the appearances that people say that they had of Jesus. Uh -huh. And also it means that those people go to their deaths um, believing a lie and, and, pro and um, proposing a lie. There's a theory that the authorities stole the body. Trouble with that is as soon as Christianity is a problem, why don't they just produce the body? And again, it doesn't explain the appearances. Yeah. There's the, there's the, um, there's the swoon theory that Jesus wasn't really dead. Uh -huh. um, but then he managed to pull away the stone from his grave and come out and, and convince everybody he's, he's risen from the dead. That's a modern theory. Nobody ever took it seriously in the ancient world. It, it appeared 200 years ago, uh -huh. and it implies that Romans don't know how to crucify people. And it implies that when Jesus gets a sword stuck in his side and blood and water comes out, which medical people say is what happens when your pericardium gets burst, that Jesus is somehow going to survive that. So it's not the case that there is a, um, a theory that people are happy with. There's, there's disarray. And so it does pass that test. And now the other miracle claims that you're talking about where people, um, you know, say I've got a sore back and now I feel better after somebody prayed for me. Um, well, maybe that was a miracle. I have to allow that as a Christian, but I don't know. I would admit there's not good evidence for that miracle, but there is good evidence for this miracle. Wouldn't I, if I was a reasonable person and I was being as intellectually honest as possible, wouldn't I just then leave that open in my mind as we don't have a good explanation for this? It could be a miracle, probably not, but it could be, and then just leave it there until something else is presented as such? Yeah, I think... I have a lot of sympathy with that uh -huh. um, because um, it is hard to know the truth of all sorts of things in life. And it would be nice to be able to hold everything off um, as it were until one was certain. Uh -huh. And I'm, a, I'm someone actually who's um, felt the force of atheism a couple of times in my life when I went to uni and when I left uni uh -huh. um, for different reasons. Um, Those I, damn college I, kids, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, interestingly enough, the, when I went to uni, the reason I was I struggled with my faith was because I um, had a minister who I trusted who made a sexual advance to me, and so that really okay. shook me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the time when I left university it was more of a classic uh, college thing where I was confronted with a whole lot of uh, questions to my faith and really had to struggle with them. Uh -huh. So uh, different different sorts of reasons. Um, now, why did I say all that? Uh, because we were talking, oh, atheism, that's right. Uh -huh. Yeah. But unfortunately, I think life is such that you are forced to, as it were, live as though you're an atheist or a theist. You, you kind of, it really matters what you decide about this stuff. And so you do, I think, have to make decisions. I don't know if you agree with that. Because you, you would functionally be an atheist, wouldn't you? You'd live as though God didn't exist. You wouldn't pray to him, ask for his care or advice or anything like that. Yeah, I don't buy into like a like a Pascal's wager kind of thing. I, I live as an atheist, essentially. Um, I, I guess my, my challenge to you or a more aggressive uh, line of inquiry would be it, it appears as though there might be things that are inexplicable historically, unfortunately, but there are things that are inexplicably historically for a ton of different reasons. Um, I believe that the most honest person has to leave their mind open to everything, but I don't think you can jump to one particular conclusion. Um, I, my, my history is really bad, but I'm sure that there is a, a, like hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of examples in history of really mysterious things happening where nobody... Um, oh God, I might, I might just be totally wrong. Um, have, was there a colony in the United States called Roanoke? Does this sound like a thing or am I making this up? It's your country. Oh, shit. Okay, I'm <laughs> just going to say this like it might be true, and I might be making this whole thing up. But I believe that there was a colony called Roanoke Colony, and my understanding is that the everybody in that colony completely disappeared. And I don't think anybody historically has any idea. Now, there are like 
Some people say that they, they wandered off for food and died of a disease or that natives came in and killed them. But I think yeah. that, um, or that they starved to death in some other area. But I don't think anybody knows historically 100%. Nobody knows where those people went. So like I could assume that it was an alien abduction, that uh, maybe it was a, a bad miracle or something, or a good miracle. Maybe they were assumed to heaven. Um, but, you know, I think instead I just, I'll remain open. Who knows what happened and who's not. But I'm not going to make, I definitely wouldn't change the course of my modern day life based on an open question historically when, especially from thousands of years ago. That, that would be how I would view that, yeah. I, would, I don't really understand what you mean when you say that an open-minded person has to leave, sorry, has some, someone has to leave their mind open about everything. You, you don't, you can't mean that. Uh, you you believe all sorts of things that you can't prove. Yeah, but only when I'm, um, to, for quantum physics, only when I have to collapse the wave function, only when I need to make a decision on something will I necessarily make a decision on something. Um, so for instance, um, man, I'm trying to think, but like when I start my car every day, I don't know if there's a bomb under the hood, but I, I can't really, I don't, I don't have the necessary technical ability to check my engine every single day. I'll start my car assuming it's gonna start and function the same way it always has. Um, so that's a decision that I'm forced to make every day, but I don't think I'm forced to make a decision every day on like, is God real? Um, I don't know if that would, if, I, I just, I don't think I'm confronted with like, now you have to make a decision, unless somebody held a gun to my head and forced me to do it. But, but then even if they did, um, I would err on the side of what do I have kind of like the most belief for and a few historical examples that are open-ended that maybe a miracle happened I don't think would be enough to say I'm going to now live my life in this whole different direction Yeah, so with the disappearing colony or the um, or that crazy thing that happened to the Malaysian airline flight or, or whatever Oh, yeah mm -hmm. um, um, You know there certainly are inexplicable things um, in history and so then i guess it does get back to you know what are the what are the stakes of the question involved you know are the stakes high or not mm -hmm. um in the case of jesus jesus wasn't just a carpenter who um you know lived an ordinary life he died and then hey uh, there's claims that he came back from the dead mm -hmm. um there's a whole um body of teaching with jesus that he talks about a whole lot of questions which are i guess central to to human life and um is he's a very impressive character and if you believe um the evidence for his miraculous healings and so on mm -hmm. uh, his, his rising from the dead was not a complete freak occurrence but actually was part of a a kind of an integrated life that that makes sense not only of his life but it makes sense of ours as well. So there's a lot of, a lot at stake, I think. I mean, there's a lot of human questions that mm -hmm. even if you don't have to answer the question, is there a God, you do have to answer, it seems to me, questions like um, what is love? What's the purpose of life? Mm -hmm. um, what happens to me when I die? Um, well, I don't know if you have to answer necessarily those. It'd be nice to have the answer to those. So here is something I'll say, almost bringing a full circle about moral philosophy in the beginning. I think one of the reasons that it's so easy for me to live probably as an atheist and not think so much about religious questions is that it seems to be the case that like 99% of humans have like 95% of the same moral intuitions. I think that if there were huge divergences of human behavior, maybe I would be forced more to confront some of these strange events and make a, a harder decision. So let's say that Christians, for instance, um, believed that um, you necessarily need to have a five-person polycule relationship, and when you raise a child, they have to be sent off to another family. Like, let's say there were a whole bunch, of, and let's say that everybody believed these things, where every single group had dramatically different ways of living life. At that point, I might be forced to sit down and I was like, okay, we need to get all the evidence, and we need to induce, uh, or inductively decide, like, wh which way are we going with this? It's really important. But when it is the case that, like, if you compare the lifestyle that I live in general, uh, like, and you compare it to, like, a religious person, um, you know, like, I believe there's, like, a ton of overlap in the values that we share and the ways that we treat other people and how we raise our children, um, such that I'm not forced to come to a hard decision where it's like, well, you need to decide right now, are you going to do this thing or are you going to believe in this other thing? Um, I think there'd have to be a bigger divergence of lifestyles otherwise, is what I would say. But you might disagree with that, yeah. Um, 
Well, uh, I suppose I have a couple of responses. Mm -hmm. The first response is that um, I care about the way the world actually is. So truth matters to me. And so uh, therefore it is of great interest to me whether there is a God or not. Um, the second comment I'd make is that, um, and then we're, we're here where I guess we're back to this, you know, talking about subjective experience, but I guess you just shared some of yours. Mm -hmm. um, I would say um, being a Christian has been really, I guess, life-giving for me. I've found that um, I've been able to um, forgive people that have been, it's been very important for me to forgive. Um, I've noticed a change in myself that I, I think that um, a basic human delusion is to see ourselves as the center of the universe when that's clearly not the case. Mm -hmm. um, there's the Christian view of people and relationships is that we're both infinitely small and infinitely precious and loved mm -hmm. on that. I find that really life-giving because being infinitely small allows you to work with other people and function in society and see yourself in the right way, I guess. Mm -hmm. not being Can I, um, I want to challenge the first thing you said based on everything that came afterwards and you might agree, you might disagree. So, um, you said something, the first thing that you said was, I care about the way the world is. Truth matters to me. Um, yes. I don't know if we talked about this first time. Um, I'll be super honest. I used to believe that, and then I took a lot of drugs, and I no longer believe that. Um, I don't think that truth is important, or the way the world is, or knowing how that is, is important. I am actually instrumentalist when it comes to truth, such that the only reason why gathering knowledge is important to me is if I can use it in some way to improve my life. And I would justify that by, you made that statement, but then afterwards, every statement you made, I would agree with. So if the truth of Jesus Christ or Christianity, if you were able to leverage that to improve your view of the world, and when I say improve your view of the world, I mean have a healthy relationship with people, um, do better acts, um, have a better feeling of your place in the world, um, I think that those things are important. And if you can have some information or knowledge, I guess whether it's true or not, you can leverage in a way that improves your uh, place in the world. I think that those things are good and, and i would hope that even as an atheist you can take those from other people um i hate him to death absolutely and i it, hey, i hate to even mention anything about him but um you're familiar with young i'm assuming right a little yeah the the idea that there are certain archetypes that exist throughout history and every religion and every culture and everything um even if you don't believe in the religious story or you don't believe in the myths I think that you would be dishonest not to say there must be some underlying fact of the matter there, or there must be some part of the human experience that is true there. Even if the story itself isn't true, it has to be getting at, or there must be something underneath that's true. So I think those types of things demand attention or detail. So if it was the case that like a religious person is like, hey, my life is really good uh, because I'm nice to my family and I'm nice to people around me and I'm community oriented and blah, blah, blah. I think it would be stupid as an atheist to say, <laughs> you believe all that because you're religious. Like, and I'm not, I don't believe in God. So forget all of that. It's probably more likely that even if I say, which I do, I don't believe in God. I don't think God is real. If people are able to derive so much happiness out of all this other stuff, there probably is some underlying fact of the matter there that some part of that behavior is a positive thing for human experience. If that makes sense. <clears throat> wow. Um, so, so you said truth isn't important to you and the ultimate thing is just that you're happier yeah. and that the idea reach reach the conclusion that truth isn't important to you from um the experiences you talked about with drugs mm -hmm. and realizing that the way that uh, as you described it to me before it was oh by the way just let me know when you have to stop i'm enjoying this but just no i'm good you're good me. um you said that um when you took drugs it kind of convinced you to lose confidence in your rational processes i think or something like that i don't know if i say fun. lose confidence in my rational processes um, but more to understand that those processes in and of themselves aren't good, but it's rather what comes from those processes. Um, so the particular experience would be, what I learned was there may in fact be some truths that if I learned them only make me worse off. And then the question is, is would I really wanna learn those truths? Um, 
So when I took a lot of mushrooms, the, the, the idea was for a while I felt like I'm stuck in a room and this is the entirety of the universe and everything that I believed before was a delusion about other people. And then I had the feeling of like, man, even if I have unlocked like this universal truth that nothing exists and I'm just a person in this room, I think I would rather go back to the other place where I was delusional and believed in all these other things. Um, and then coming out of that trip, I kind of thought like, man, I wonder like if I'm, what if I'm crazy now, but I was more sane on drugs um, that was just a wholly miserable experience. I don't gain anything from that truth. It's horrible. I think that there might be some truthful things that if you learn them, they don't really contribute positively to your life. Therefore, maybe the truth that I gather is only good insofar as I can leverage it to improve my life or the quality of my life or the people around me. Yeah. So if truth doesn't matter and the improving the quality of your life uh, is all that matters, then uh, would you, if something made you happy, but it was it was patently false would that be okay with you i think the i think the answer always has to be yes um the really common thought experiment i'm sure you've heard, have you heard of the experience machine no oh shoot um i don't know who proposes but the idea is is if you could hook yourself up to a machine and once you're in the machine everything in your life is perfect. It's not real because you're in a machine, but everything is absolutely perfect. And then you lose all prior thought of ever having been put in the machine. Um, would you say yes or no to that? Um, I don't know of any justification where you can ever say no. It seems like you have to say yes, assuming that once you go in, you forget everything prior because then everything becomes perfect insofar as your experience is concerned. Or maybe you have a way to escape that. I'm curious here. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you have the technology to do that. Just... Um take a huge dose of opioids and get everybody to give them to you until you die. And that, that's, that's your experience. Um, why don't you do that? Um, because I, well, because one making the decision now is not, isn't a good experience. <laughs> I don't think that, um, it, it would have to be something that's like forced on you because the process of entering the experience machine in and of itself would be, um, it would be an inhuman, it would be a really difficult thing to do. Right. Um, Okay, but yeah. uh, I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have an answer to it, but I guess mm -hmm. I'd just say my my I guess opinion as a as a Christian is mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I said about Christianity is that there's a there's a picture of human flourishing. Mm -hmm. So you're saved from sin, but you're saved for something else, which is a a life of community and so on. And in that picture of human flourishing, I'll do all sorts of things to get me up to a level that helps me function that way, but I won't do things that go beyond that because I've got a kind of benchmark or norm of what human life would be like. And so um, I've had trouble with depression in the past and I take a, a mild dose of antidepressants at night to help me sleep. Mm -hmm. And that brings me up to help me function. Mm -hmm. I don't take mushrooms, um, no disrespect to anybody who does, but I don't take mushrooms because I don't want to go beyond what I consider to be a, a level of human functioning, a flourishing human life. Mm -hmm. So. Um, from the little I know of you, um, you've got a son, you're in a network of relationships with him, um, even though he, he washes his hands and magically makes the water disappear. Yeah. That's important, uh, as it should be, I would say. And so to hook yourself up to that machine and kind of tune out mm -hmm. um, forever, I think would be a morally bad thing to do. Um, so, um, so I guess it depends on whether you have a picture of human life, uh, what human life should look like. And if your only picture of human life is is a pure utilitarian thing, just maximize pleasure minus pain, well, then I guess the experience machine makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's not my picture. Gotcha. And then I guess th th these positions would also flow from our meta-ethical understandings of what, if you have a stronger understanding of what is goodness as deriving from a Christian sense, then obviously it would be an immoral thing to do to disconnect yourself from the world or any responsibilities and to entertain some falsehood. By definition, that would flow pretty naturally, I would imagine, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you, but you, you say that you're convinced by that, but you're not doing what you could do. I mean, you really could hook yourself up onto opioids and, and you say it's an unpleasant experience, but if you thought it all through and you really thought that it wouldn't be an unpleasant experience at all, it would be full of joyful anticipation, surely. Yeah, there's there's like, there's weird, um, there's, there's, there's weird challenges to, um, we have two understandings, uh, like an intellectual understanding of things versus like an emotional understanding of things. And even if the intellectual understanding is there, maybe the emotional understanding isn't. Um, I'm sure there are better examples of this and I, I hate to use this as an example because it's a really shitty one, but there are a number of people that are depressed that feel as though suicide would be a better out. 
Um, but killing yourself is a big deal and they don't like, even if they intellectually might think that like, if I die, it's going to be better. They don't actually go through and do it. Um, now it might be tempting to ask, well, I shouldn't say tempting to ask. I'm sorry. I'm in philosophy mode right now. Um, one might ask a person, well, why don't you just kill yourself if you're depressed all the time? And they say, well, I, I, you know, I wouldn't, you know, because I don't. However, it's interesting that if you look at people that are, um, manic depressive, uh, people that are bipolar, um, one of the biggest worries for those types of people is that when they are on an emotional upswing, that emotional side of things might suddenly come into line with the intellectual things. And sometimes when people enter a manic phase, when they've been heavily depressed for a while, they're like, oh my God, I feel great. Like, I'm gonna kill myself. I actually have the feeling now. And then they go through and they do it. And that's why some of those people end up killing themselves when it seems like they just got on an upswing. So um, to, to bring this back, like, it might be the case that there is some like ultimately happy like heroin machine that I can hook myself to and it's like, oh my God, I have the best experience ever and then I die and it's great. Um, but one, I don't think I feel confident enough about the afterlife and my experience and everything here to, to truly go forward with that. Um, because in the hypothetical, it's presented as such that like this is 100% of you know all of that. I don't know in the real world if I am as sure of that. Um, and then two, it would require an ungodly amount of like intellectualizing because I would have to emotionally separate myself from everything that I love in this world, right? Like, I don't want to just abandon my son. I don't want to abandon my fiance. I don't want to abandon everybody that I know and just do that, right? So that, that, that would be a hard hurdle to come overcome, even if intellectually I did believe in a particular thing. Yeah, sorry, okay. Okay. Um, what did you say you weren't confident enough about the afterlife? I was intrigued by that. Um, there's... Um... I'm sure. Okay. Um, unfortunately, a lot of my, a lot of my, um, extra physics, extra whatever stuff has kind of been informed by, um, some drug experiences, I guess. Um, so he here is an interesting challenge that I came up with to myself in the middle of a vegan debate. It wasn't really about this, but I, it, it entered my mind and I, and I haven't even been able to shake it. So I would consider myself to be like a strict, like materialist slash physicalist. I don't believe in the supernatural or anything like that, right? I only believe in what I can see, what I can verify and everything like that. However, <clears throat> I have a conscious experience. I obviously believe in that. I, I it is my experience. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure other people have conscious experiences, but there's absolutely no way for me to observe that or verify that. So it would seem to be the case that it's hard for me to say that I believe in a strictly physical world when there are other things that exist out there that I have absolutely no way of measuring. And my understanding is right now, there is no way to measure if something is conscious. That we just don't even have the tools for it. Maybe we don't have the sensory organs for it. So if I'm to accept that I must accept dualism on some level, there must be some other substance that's immaterial. Um, if I have to accept that, then who knows about like a uh, afterlife or extra dimensional stuff or whatever. It would be foolish of me to assert that like, well, once I die, I know for sure everything is over when there's already some things that exist on this planet that I don't have 100% a good way of grappling with. Yeah. Sorry. Or miracles perhaps. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Um, that's interesting because, uh, you know, there's a famous argument for the existence of God by a philosopher. He wrote a book called God and Other Minds, uh -huh. and it works in the analogy of minds that, um, you know, we, when you think of another person, uh, you can give a, a stripped down materialist description of the other person, uh -huh. but we believe that they have other minds uh -huh. and we relate to them on the basis that they have other minds. We have, as it were, faith that here's another conscious being we can't prove it, we can't observe it, we can't measure it in, in a sort of physical way. I mean, you can look at charts of brain activity, but we all know that. But that, a, that doesn't, a, to be clear, that absolutely doesn't, and we agree, brain activity no. does not tell you whether there's a conscious no. experience. Yeah, for sure, yeah. And you proceed on that basis, and then it works. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's actually what being a Christian is like too. You proceed on the basis of trust, and it works. Sure. So, but the only difference is I would say is that like, um, as I said in the beginning of this, um, I don't believe in absolute knowledge of anything. I think everything that we do in life is inductive, is probabilistic. Deduction is for math and philosophy, but in the real world, everything is inductively done. Um, you can only speak in degrees of probability always. Um, and so I just have to look at like, what is the available evidence for what I believe in probabilistically? Yeah. Go ahead. I think this is incoherent. When you say, "Go ahead," I believe in absolute anything. Mm -hmm. That statement is an absolute. 
It, isn't there an escape from this? I feel like I've read this. There's because when somebody says there are no absolute statements, there's an objection. Well, that's an absolute absolute statement. But I thought I thought there was some loser prop philosophy like, oh, well, this is actually there's an escape from this particular thing, isn't there? I don't think so. I I, th I think there is. I don't remember well, what it is. Me, but... Drop me a line. Drop me a line when you find sure, it. I'll, <laughs> I'll I'll find it. But like, I'm pretty sure you can say. Or maybe that maybe the grammar works, but syntactically, if you were to do this philosophically, it would be you'd make that statement differently. That like, like there are no absolute statements. Well, that's it's absolutely true that there are no absolutes. I, I'm pretty sure there's an escape from that. I don't know, but I, I believe in that. I don't think that I don't think I can have absolute knowledge of anything. I guess. Well, then I guess I could say I'm not even absolutely sure that I can have absolute knowledge and everything. So there absolutely. you go. Absolutely. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> The only other the only other collapse of a position that's as effective as that is logical positivism. Have you heard of this? The people that said that the only thing you can know for sure, mm -hmm. the only confidence you can have in truth is truth that's proved by mathematics or experiments. Okay. And then somebody asked the unkind question whether that last statement was proved by mathematics or experiments, and it isn't. So the whole position collapsed. Sure, gotcha. So that was it was a big deal in philosophy in the early 20th century. The guy who invented it, who got knighted for it, I think, A.J. Eyre, he admitted that it was that his philosophy couldn't give an account of its own position, and so it just collapsed. Gotcha. So yeah, okay. It's worth asking about the basic the basic assumption. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think that when it comes to as an atheist, so when I was in my teens, late teens, I was. And this is the story of probably every person ever. I was far more militant in my beliefs. Um, I think I would even have gone as far as I'm not an atheist. I'm an anti-theist. I hate religious people, blah, 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 blah. Um, as I've gotten older, I think that insofar as religion exists, if, if it guides some human behavior, that's fine. Um, if it guides how people view the world, that's fine. My only issue is that when people allow their religious viewpoints to intervene in a way that directly contradicts our like empirical understanding of the world. Um, I'm a really big fan of, uh, maybe I'm biased, but I think the Catholic Church has been pretty good about saying that like science is a process, God, you know, has created the world, so of course we'll follow science. Like I I'm pretty sure the Catholic Church recognizes like evolution and stuff now. Am I making that up? I think the Pope made statements about this. I um, think it does. Yeah, so insofar yeah. as like, if you are a religious person, that's great. My only issue is when, and this is usually the bigger problems I have with religion, is when people let um, the religious parts of their minds subsume their physical understanding of the world, and you get to people who are like, they're feeding their children only vegetables or they don't take them to the hospital because they don't believe in that or whatever because of some religious belief and it's like okay well now there's like a harm that's being caused here because you're you're avoiding things that we know empirically to be good for people um insofar as however we define good and now you're letting the religious part of your mind uh, uh interfere with that those are the things that i tend to have problems with but if somebody's religious and they don't make those types of um interventions in their life where they're doing things that just aren't good because of religion i tend to not have problems with it you know so um, now this is another big question. I'm happy to keep talking about it, but if you want to, yeah, go for it. So, what are the greatest harms that Christianity does? Um, the greatest harms that Christianity does. Um, if you think it does, I'm uncomfortable. I really don't like Christianity because it's so broad. But if I were to be broadly speaking. I would say that when people bring in their Christian beliefs and they use it to inform some scientific beliefs, um, so like one example might be, there might be a Christian person that says, climate change isn't real, um, you know, God put fossil fuel on the planet for us to use it, therefore, you know, like it can't be a bad thing, um, there's nothing in the Bible about climate change, you know, the, the God controls the earth and all of that, that wouldn't happen. So somebody like that would be, though this is kind of a hypothetical harm. Um, I need a moment to think of like, what are some real widespread, because most of the issues I'm going to have are going to fall on social issues, like being anti-gay marriage or something, but that's a little bit harder to... Um... Um, just on that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that is a very... Uh, I'm, I, I do understand that people talk that way, but it's a mm -hmm. very weird Christianity to, to run the argument that you just ran about climate change. Uh -huh. um, it's it's a very strange uh, form of Christianity to to argue in that way. Yeah, and usually my arguments are because people are quick to attack religions for some people's crazy thoughts, but a lot of the times it feels ad hoc to me. 
where you have for other reasons you want to believe something and then you'll bring in your religion afterwards to try to justify it. Um, so religion ends up being used to justify some things, but I don't really think it's necessarily because of the religion. Um, that just happens to be the tool that they use to justify it, but yeah. It makes it complicated. That makes it complicated. But there is such a thing as a Christian worldview. There is a, a picture of human flourishing, and so it seems mm -hmm. to me that... Um, oh, I okay, I have a good example. Um, maybe okay. it's not like this in Australia, but in the United States for a long time, um, I would argue that it is just objectively a fact of the world that teenagers are going to engage in sexual activity with, with each other. I, I don't know if there's ever been a point in human history where this has been stopped. If we believe that's true, then I think the next statement we can make, we can all probably agree that teenage pregnancies and all of STDs or whatever are bad. Um, so if, the, if that is to be true, there's two things that we can probably say with, with pretty high certainty. Some level of formal sex education is probably important, and some level of availability of contraception is probably important. And it seems like in the United States, these two things get massive pushback from primarily religious people on the basis that premarital sex is a sin. That would be an area where I feel like a religious intervention is causing like a net harm to at least the United States. Um, right. Well, it's hard to, yeah. I think it would be superficial for me to respond to that without giving a little background. Go for it. Which is um, Christian attitudes to sex and relationships are very different to contemporary secular understanding of sex and relationships for sure so i mean there'd be two there'd be two huge areas of difference which i'm sure you're aware of mm -hmm. the first area is that um uh in the christian scriptures when it says that god created the world there's actually a special description of the goodness of male and female mm -hmm. so it's virtually a quote in the uh, from genesis that he created them male and female he created them. so there's something um afforded to this idea of male and female which is which is supposed to be really good mm -hmm. so that's number one whereas in contemporary culture as you know that's regarded as um with suspicion or it's seen as a narrative of oppression and so on and so so that's one big difference the other big difference is that yes sex is regarded as something that should happen uh within committed loving relationship Mm -hmm. Whereas my understanding of contemporary sex, uh, secular culture, and you can correct me if I've got this wrong, is that the main emphasis is on consent. Now, consent, uh, love and commitment ought to imply consent, mm -hmm. but consent doesn't necessarily imply love and commitment. So there's all sorts of um, sexual practices which, um, you know, a, a secular person, a utility maximizing person, might say are okay because parties consent to them whereas the christian i'd say uh -huh. no they're not really okay um don't please don't misunderstand me though i'm all in favor of laws to try and promote consent i think all sexual activity even sexual activity which i think is wrong morally ought uh -huh. to be consensual sure so that's the kind of background there's a completely different vision of um of what sex is about and what relationships are about uh -huh. But having said all that, um, so having said all that, the particular issues you're talking about, I mean, I'd go on a kind of case by case basis. I, I, I think yes, some form of sex education is good. Um, I think that um, uh, if you're convinced that a teenager is going to have sex, then it's a difficult moral choice whether you think, say, you're a parent, it's a difficult moral choice whether you uh, provide them um, contraceptives because. You might be thinking you're encouraging an activity, but but you might make that decision because you're convinced they're going to do it anyway. Uh -huh. And world of wrongs, um, having sex which you regard as immoral is a lesser wrong than having an unwanted baby. So, so I could be convinced of that. Um, and what's the other one? Contraception. I think I think it's it comes under the same heading for me. Yeah, it's like hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So. Um, but I suppose it's a it's a no-brainer for you because you don't feel that tension at all. You don't you don't feel there's a tension, you don't feel that there is a there's anything desirable about oh uh -huh. I'm I'm a 
but I'm hearing you saying you don't think there's anything desirable about uh, keeping sex for marriage. Yeah, so uh, the secular view is sex is almost purely like a recreational activity between two people. Um, whereas the my understanding of the Catholic tool was um, sex is for having children and for strengthening the bond between husband and wife. Um, and that's why it's granted to people as that. Um, but this would be an area where, yeah, I, yeah, that's just, this is just an example where like, um, I'm not religious, and for the most part, I don't really care what religious people think, but when we clash here, um, when things flow down to the, to, to the normative a, a level, like, I, uh, again, not to trigger the, um, you said you did ethics, so I'm not trying to trigger you too hard, but like, I think that most of the, most of the like applied ethics positions, I think are going to look really similar between intelligent, like virtue ethicists, deontologists, uh, consequentialists, like, I think all three of these people normatively are going to arrive at positions where it's like, we probably shouldn't murder people, um, whether because we shouldn't be using them to an end or whatever, as a deontologist would say, or whether it would result in a net decrease of utility, as a consequentialist would say, or whether it you know, exhibits some poor virtue, as maybe the virtue, we're all gonna get there, more or less the same, I think. Um, but this is an area where we have a huge break in terms of how we decide what, what is good or bad, and then that huge schism in, in my worldview leads to a markedly worse world where more teens are getting pregnant, more abortions are happening, more STDs are spreading. And now I have a problem where it's like, okay, well, we have to go and fight on some higher ethics level because this is causing something that I think is actually truly bad. Um, whereas a lot of other religious thought isn't, yeah. Yeah, I think this is a good example of where, where the difference really matters. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm really interested in what you think about the sexual revolution. I've got a, a theory about the sexual revolution, which I'm going to ask you, which is that, um, I would say, so let, let's let's talk about my computer for a second. My computer sure. is alien to me. Uh, Wait, you're, it cut out for a sec. You said your computer is what to you? Alienable. Oh, it's okay, a legal okay. word. I can transfer it to you. Uh -huh. It's a thing. It has no feelings and it has no uh, claim to my ownership that I can't just relinquish. Uh -huh. Your son uh, is not alienable to you. You can't sell me your son. Um, he's a person, he has feelings, and um, he has a moral right to your proximity. So you're not allowed legally to separate yourself from your son and, and sell him to me. Okay. And who are my children. Um, so in my view, which is extremely, extremely controversial view, a lot of people see the sexual revolution as, as a left-wing phenomena about a fight for social justice. Mm -hmm. And I do acknowledge that partly and I can tell you why in a second. So I do acknowledge that, but I basically think overwhelmingly that the sexual revolution is actually a kind of right wing triumph of market liberalism applied to relationships. I think what it's done is taken sexual partners from the category of people like our children and put them into the category of things. So I regard the huge amount of pornography and legalized prostitution not as not as uh, a little bit of untidiness in an otherwise idyllic sexual landscape. I regard them as emblematic of the sexual revolution, taking people from taking sexual partners from people and turning them into things. So I think there's a very big difference probably between us on this. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, turning people into things. Um, I'll, okay, well, before I get into my view, I guess, I'll fight you a little bit, because I'm curious. Um, in some ways, I can see what you're saying, but I'll, I'll fight you on the, on the strictness of this. So I would argue that this is incongruent with what you said earlier, that proponents of the sexual revolution or the secular advocates of the sexual revolution still appear to define healthy sexual interactions as consensual ones. The consent thing seems to be pretty unique, though, between people in a way that doesn't appear between people and other objects. Um, for instance... I don't have to give examples. I don't ask for consent from my car to drive it or consent from my computer to use it, but I do from another person to have sex with it um, or them or he or she or whatever you would say, right? So I, I don't know in what ways do you think, are you just talking about like the broader, like the commodification or the gamification of sex okay. or what yes, more specifically yes, do you mean? I'm talking about those and I'll concede your point. I'll concede, I'll concede that straight away. Yes, I can see, I can see that you're right in that, um, if you ask for consent from somebody, mm -hmm. then that is a mark of respect. And so it is different to, to, you don't have the power over a person that you do 
over a thing mm -hmm. to just you without it asking for its consent. So I, I, I'll concede that. Um, having said that, though, the nature of the consent uh, is an interesting question. And, um, and there is an understanding that you can consent to something. And then as soon as the person, I, I suppose this is what I mean, as soon as the person ceases to be of use to you, you can separate from them a sexual partner I'm talking about now. As, as soon as the person ceases to be of use to you, you can get rid of them. Uh -huh. um, now they might consent to that, so that's an interesting question. Okay, so maybe so I, I don't even think you necessarily have to concede the first statement, but rather than saying that like we use people um, in terms of like uh, like objects, we can say there might be some level of objectification there because you can objectify a person and they're still like a person, but in some ways you're treating them as an object. So. For instance, you know, we're not just trying to rape everybody, but we might be trying to have sex with somebody and then abandon them shortly thereafter in a way that is, it, is a different way. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that definitely seems to be more in line with secular sexual views versus like religious ones, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Do I, wait, did you ask if I agree? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, no, but does it worry you morally? Morally, no, I don't because I don't really because I because I'm a moral anti-realist. I don't. That's a whole other basket. Like I, I don't make. I don't. Yeah. Um, but without without opening all of that, so the the something that I'll say in regards to this, and it kind of harkens back to something I said earlier about how there's an underlying fact of the matter. I think that sometimes people get so obsessed with deconstructing social norms that they don't understand why they existed in the first place. And I think we have a really big problem at viewing something as a social construct and then saying, because it's a social construct, it's arbitrary and there's no underlying fact of the matter. So for instance, if I take a look at societies and I see that they are a certain way and they have been a certain way for all of human history, and then I say, you know, they could be a totally different way. That is true, but I think that it, I think that it's very important for you to take a look and say, well, hold on, why are things the way that they were? Even if I say that it's somewhat arbitrary or somewhat subjective or socially constructed, maybe there are some underlying facts of the matter there. I feel like people are too quick to throw out everything from the prior generation or way of doing things and then just do whole new things without stopping for a moment to think like, okay, well, what is, um, why? maybe there were reasons why people did the things that they did before. So in regards to like sexual activity, um, so I'm a very secular, sexual, whatever person. I, I do a lot of things. But there, there are traditionally relationships between two people existed in certain ways such that there usually were some levels of sexual commitment there. And something that I've seen personally and something that everybody knows societally is people talk about this idea of, oh, everybody should be able to have sex with everybody and it'd be super cool and blah, blah, blah. And I do agree. That is super cool. But when we watch how that plays out in the real world, there are lots of people that intellectually say they want to engage in sexual relationships they do there's no commitment there and then it ends and there are negative feelings there that are very hard to understand because you don't have an intellectual way of understanding them like well i had fun with somebody i had sex with them we both consented to it and it was awesome and in the terms of like how i view my modern secular understanding everything should be good but man i feel really bad and i don't have a way of understanding that i have an emotion that i can't you know like put voice to and that's a problem because some people as i said before are too quick to throw out everything in the prior organization of things in in favor of like a new way of understanding things where they don't ever pay attention to why things were the way they were for that was really wordy but yeah um so what i'd say about being a christian is it makes the most sense of my total experience mm -hmm. so um when you say there's no intellectual way of understanding that i would i would say well there certainly is that um your intuitions are telling you something important that this is just not the way we're designed to be to be having sex with everybody and no strings attached. Um, and I, I I don't know if you consider yourself a left-wing person, but I've I've got a question uh, for a supposed left-wing person. Maybe it's you, maybe it's not. Okay. But um, the most left-wing people would believe in, um, in income redistribution. Mm -hmm. They'd believe in the pension and they'd believe in externalities you know when when say with global warming and things like that that there are market transactions that you can do that have unintended consequences for others uh -huh. and you ought to take 
and then picks them up. Gotcha. So I'm a big left wing person, so I'm big on all three of these things. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. okay. Then I think you ought to support traditional marriage destiny because when we think about the goods that are available in romantic sexual relationships, traditional marriage is a form of income redistribution, pension, and taking account of externalities. It's a form of income distribution. Uh, it's a form of income redistribution because you are probably aware. I mean, you don't need me to show you this, but I'm just going to show it to you because it's fun. Um, have you seen? Um, oops. Oh, has this come up again or not? Um, yep. Okay. So this is a this is a chart. You know. You know. Have you heard of the Gini coefficient for measuring inequality? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so low Gini means a uh, very equal society and a high Gini means a very unequal society. So this is from my book. This is um, somebody did a Gini coefficient where they went onto a dating site mm -hmm. and every like that someone received was like a dollar to them. Mm -hmm. okay. And so you're able to get from a whole range of people on a dating site, it's a heterosexual dating site, a whole range of people on a dating site, mm -hmm. every like that someone receives is like a dollar and then you can work out the Gini coefficient. So the people at the most attractive people who receive the most likes have got the most dollars. And then you go down the income distribution and you see how quickly it drops off. Mm -hmm. And so then they, um, they worked out a Gini coefficient for men and women on the heterosexual dating site. Mm -hmm. And I poked them there in between countries. And so, um, so interestingly enough, I don't know if this stands up in other, um, you know, whether that's true in other sites apart from this dating site. But interestingly enough, heterosexual women receive likes in a fairly equal way. Mm -hmm. That's to say um, a lot of women receive likes and so the income is fairly evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. But heterosexual men, so, so they're more like France and Germany in terms of, in, in terms of income redistribution. But um, places like um, uh, heterosexual men are, are far more skewed. So there's a relatively small group of men that are deemed to be attractive, whatever that means and a large tail that are not. And so, I don't know. <laughs> Is, have you ever heard of the term? Oh man, I don't know how much, because um, there's there's so much like internet ideology related to this. Have you ever heard of the term hypergamy? No, it's a great term. Oh man, mean? Um, I, I don't want to, when I'm worried, I'm sending you down a bad path. Um, so there are... Um, it's all right, we're consenting adults. Yeah. Um, but th so there are terms of people online. You've heard of the term incel, I'm sure, right? No. You, you said yeah, right? No, no, no. Incel? Oh, you've never heard of the term incel? No. Oh, okay. Man, there's there's so much. Forget all of that, okay? But there okay. there are there are theories of sexual marketplaces and how they function today. And okay. one common talking point of this group of people, I'll call them red pillars, is um, this concept of hypergamy. And the concept of hypergamy is that the top 20% of men are fucking 80% of the women across these dating apps. And it's just funny because the chart that you showed showing a high yeah, inequality yeah. between the values of men and a low inequality versus the values of women that most women are valued by most men and women selectively value men much differently kind of plays into that idea. Not that mm -hmm. that's a good or bad thing. I, that was just an, it's interesting that you bring that up or whatever, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. All right, so let's talk about traditional marriage. Mm -hmm. Or can I actually, real quick on, on, that, on that chart you showed, so the implication of what you're saying is that if we encourage traditional marriage in this sense, the inequality that men face would be lesser because everybody is kind of like pairing off with each other. Is that kind of the implication? Yeah, that's, I was getting to that. So, okay. so in, a, in a traditional marriage sense, in a society that broadly accepts it, and, and let's allow for marriage breakup and everything, but say that one that accepts it much more than is now, mm -hmm. it's often true that people form a single pair mm -hmm. so that say a man that's in that that group that you were talking about um if the system kind of works will be with one woman not 20 mm -hmm. and that they will travel through life together and so when one or both of them gets less attractive, so this is where the age pension comes in when one or less of them gets less attractive they don't just get dumped mm -hmm. they carry through old age so that's that's the um, income redistribution it's the pension and when it comes to the externalities um, you know, abusive marriages aside, which are really terrible for children, um, marriages that are difficult but nonetheless could stay together uh, in a reasonable way are good for children. They're better than people splitting up. Uh -huh. so, so why aren't left-wing people 
social justice warriors, why aren't they advocates for traditional marriage? Well, so the thing, the three things that I would fight here for are on one, income redistribution. I don't think we typically argue in terms of income inequality between the sexes, although some people do, of course. Um, but the big problem is income inequality between the classes. So in the United States, if men and women had income parity, that would be cool, but it wouldn't solve the majority of the problems of income inequality, which is the difference between the people living in the poorest parts of the U.S. versus. Sorry, sorry, sorry yeah. Destiny. I, I'm using income there as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. The income I'm talking about is the is the different levels of attractiveness. I'm talking about relational goods. Oh, sure, I understand. Well, if you want to go by just the relational thing, I don't think left-wing people talk about that, right? Or that's not something they're very focused on. They're, when they talk about income redistribution, they're talking about income, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, no, but let's just talk about justice. Let's just talk about justice. The reason people don't like income inequality is because um, they don't like the idea that someone by virtue of having a lot of money mm -hmm. can have a lot of power. And they probably go along with John Rawls' idea that birth station should not determine your lot in life. And a lot of income inequality comes from where you happen to be born into. For sure. Isn't the same now, if that's unjust, that, that people who happen to be born into a lot of money can, can take advantage of it, isn't it also true? And, and look, it's interesting. Um, sexual goods and income are, are similar in this way. Someone can be rich because they're born into it or because they work hard in a free enterprise system. It's probably some combination of both. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with attractiveness. Sure. Some people have good genes, and, um, but they, probably, they can make the most of it or not. And so mm -hmm. there's a combination of things going on there. But if you care about justice, don't you care that someone who's incredibly attractive can, as it were, use a lot of people? Yeah, I think that there are questions there. Um, this diverts into a, it's a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> uh, in areas where we'd probably find a lot of agreement. I don't think I would attack it from this angle, but I think that there are a lot of good conversations that can be had about how relationships are functioning today. Um, I don't know if it's as much a function of the sexual revolution more so this the new world of like technology and internet stuff and socialization that we're in or maybe the sexual revolution impacts it a little bit but i think this is like a problem that is a big problem but i think there are a lot of really important factors that play into it beyond just whether we're monogamous or not so to formalize that a little bit more i would say that even if right now we totally switch to monogamous relationships i think what would happen is there'd just be a lot less people in relationships period um, i don't think it would fix much because of other, because of the other big confounding problems. A lot less people having sex, or you mean a lot? You, what do you mean? I think there'd just be less like... people having sex or relationships at all. That would be the case, I think. Because I think that right no. now, I would say that we have problems between whatever eighty percent of men, twenty percent of women, all, like or any of this. Those problems exist, but I, I feel like those are more problems that are fundamentally related to our socialization today that has gotten really, really, really bad, rather than just sexual revolution stuff. I, I would say plays into it more than that. So like. So to reiterate, if we today, all of our morals across the United States at least changed and we all became monogamous, I don't think it would fix much. I think instead of um, some men fucking a lot of women, they would just fuck less women and pair off and marry. But then a lot of women and a lot of men would just never talk or date or do anything at all. That's what it feels like right now. Hmm. I find that extremely implausible given the strength of sexual feelings and sexual attraction. But uh, yeah, so, so I, I don't really agree. Yeah, it seems implausible. So... There are, there are so many different suggested mechanisms for this. And then a little bit of polling data, I know. So one issue I, oh man, ah, we're, we're diving into whole other topics, so I'll just very briefly. So one problem is that I've heard people suggest, okay, so here's a fact. Women tend to be more comfortable outside of relationships than men. Now, why that is the case, a lot of people try to explore this, like, well, why? Um, because biologically, it seems like that wouldn't be the case, because if you're a woman, you'd have urges to have children, et cetera, et cetera. But it seems to be the case. Here's one suggested mechanism. I don't know if it's true or not, but this is a suggested thing. Women tend to be much more fulfilling in their friendships towards other women than men tend to be with other men. That two women are able to share feelings and talk and have a lot of good conversations. Men don't usually relate with each other that way. If that is the case and you are a man, having a a woman in your life that you can share those emotional experiences with, that's really fucking important. And without having that, you kind of feel a little bit empty or hollow. It might not be the case that women have those same feelings because it's like, oh, well, I've got a lot of cool girlfriends and we talk and we chat and I get all of that that I need from them. Um, and then to support that, I think when you look in polling data or something, it's like 
ah, fuck, the last time, I want to say it was something like 38% of women that are single are like not looking to date at all, as opposed to, I want to say it was like 20% of men. It was like, it was, it was almost half, I think, um, which Ooh. seemed to be pretty surprised. Like, oh, interesting. Um, that's one issue. A second issue has to do with um, education in the United States. Um, man, for a long time, people were thinking women were dumb and they couldn't do school. We absolutely proved that incorrect. Women are excelling hardcore in education in the United States. And holy fuck, men are getting left in the dust. Um, our uh, graduation rates right now are, it's 60-40 in favoring women. Jeez. Uh, it's dramatically outpaced them. Um, so in one standard, women are getting better jobs, they're getting more educated, which is cool, but women also hold on to this older idea of, I'm not gonna date a man that makes less money than me, that's for losers. So women are earning more and more and more, and they're climbing more socioeconomically, but they're not willing, even though they're taking on that the male role, traditionally, of earning more money, they won't take on the male role, traditionally, of dating down socioeconomically, right? Mm -hmm. 30 years ago, a guy would never say, I'm not dating her, she doesn't have any money. No, of course, that's for, you have the money, that's your job, right? Um, so uh, there's that. The socialization aspect, um, I guess this plays in your favor. Uh, I think that atheists were very quick to cede all the ritual and all the community building to religious people so that when they became a-religious, they didn't replace it with anything. Um, say what you will about church, it's really cool to be able to go to one place every weekend, see all of your friends, a whole bunch of family, extended family, everybody in your community, do community service events, listen to a guy talk about how you live a life. Um, even if you're not religious, losing that sucks. So when you've lost that, we don't have strong unions in the United States, we don't go to like any type of group things. Once you graduate school, if you're working in a, an environment with like 80% men, you're never meeting another girl in your life. I don't even know, and I'm even being honest, from my point, I don't know where the fuck I would go to meet a woman or to talk to another person, right? I meet everybody through my job, streaming. But if you work as like an engineer and your employees are 90% men, I, there's like no place to socialize anymore. You don't have those community activities. Um, we do way too much stuff online. Online stuff used to be like, online social media was supposed to make our real life relationships better. It was supposed to augment them, not replace them. Now they become a replacement for real life interaction. And if you play video games all day, or if you're in guy dominated space on the internet, you're not gonna, ever gonna talk to girls, right? So this is like four, four of like a million, all of these things I think are contributing to this really negative socialization environment we have. And I think from there stems a lot of the relationship problems that I would say these things are more relevant than just sexual revolution stuff. That was really wordy. Sorry, go ahead. No, the other thing was I said it was extremely implausible mm -hmm. what you said before, but I should add, I should, when, when you said there about the internet, mm -hmm. I should add something. Um, perhaps if a lot of people got their sexual experiences through pornography, then mm -hmm. that would make what you're saying more plausible. So, mm -hmm. you know, if there was a, if there was a situation where, you know, people just stopped meeting each other, mm -hmm. stopped dating, perhaps, perhaps they would get that, those experiences through pornography. So that's, sure. um, that's all question mark I have about, you know, otherwise I find what you said implausible, but I suppose sure. when you said what you said about the internet, it made me wonder about that as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, mental well, masturbate, but I, it's not a replacement. I think if you talk to any virgin male, especially in their 20s or 30s, and he's like, hey, you masturbate, like you're cool, like never having sex, right? I think most of them would still be like, bro, I don't care if I'm masturbating or not, I'm still lonely as fuck. You know, I think, I feel like most people would still say that, right? Yeah, I think that's probably right. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'll, okay. Well, you've persuaded me. I'll go back to what, saying what you said was implausible. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Well, look. I, so this is so it's interesting. We've come across an area where there is a quite a big difference between um, the way that secular people think and the way that um, Christians think, uh -huh. and uh, and it seems to be important. I mean, it seems to me that people uh, uh, put a great deal of store in romantic love as a, as a form of finding love in society. I actually don't, I actually as a Christian though, would want to say that one of the consequences of the sexual revolution is it shrunk the word love and, and made it far more erotic than a bigger definition of love would, would, could entail. So I think in the Christian worldview, love is a very big word. It means things like forgiving enemies. It means things like contributing to society. It means all sorts of things. Whereas we have tend, I think one of the things sexual revolution has done is shrunk love as a word. And in fact, the word love has even shrunk further to consent. I don't know what you think about that, but I... I yeah, or yeah. to go on with what you said earlier, it plays more into the uh, love it has been like kind of the victim of... Um, market liberalization like where yeah. love is something that we express in objects that are purchased for hours of our life spent you know earning a wage somewhere right how big a ring do you yeah. buy somebody what type of gifts do you get somebody where you go on vacation for like these types of things yeah yeah i think that's right i think free market liberalism has really seeped into the sexual landscape a big time it's i think um, 
Oh man, I'm not a leftist, okay? So I have to, just as a point out there, fuck the socialists and the communists, okay? Just make sure I say that. But um, I love free market liberalism and I love capitalism. I think they do really great things. Um, but I hate, and it kind of plays into everything you're saying, this concept of consumerism. Uh, I would hope that these are separate and distinct things that we can exist in a capitalist country without being a hyper consumerist country. But man, that seeping, that, that liberalism seeping into every single part of your life and defining every single thing you do um, is very sad to me. It feels like people can't, I think people have a hard time taking the good bits and pieces from things and then appreciating and liking those. It feels like it has to be fully enveloped and they have to become all of a particular thing. And then in, in some ways it just, yeah, makes things absolutely terrible. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, I've got another, I've got another theory about this, mm -hmm. which goes that um, the West's, the, if you have to find a profit for Western fundamentalism, I'd, I'd pick John Stuart Mill, who was that guy who said, you can do whatever you like as long as you don't hurt anybody else. Mm -hmm. And, um, but actually, I don't think that that's very practical. I think in any functioning human community where people are close enough to help you, they're close enough to hurt you. For sure. I mean, try and live in an isolated community, but but you you, you can avoid hurt, but you can avoid love as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think actually his maxim is not very often practical. It's not often the case that what we do literally affects nobody else. Yeah. And so we're left we're left with a problem. How do we decide what to do when we do impact on others? Well, I think I think the prophet of the West now is Friedrich Nietzsche. So he said that he 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 said you know egalitarianism, democracy is all rubbish. Um, people are certainly not equal. And he wanted to his his view of history was that um, as you, as Western society developed after the Roman period, Christianity corrupted it with what he called the slave morality. Um, you know, treasuring uh, humility and weakness and things like that. Whereas we, he he looked back, he looked forward to a, a return to the golden age of Greece and Rome, where strength and beauty and dexterity was really prized. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think that's the spirit of the West. I think that we admire people who are strong, attractive, clever. This is this is what we really value. So why hasn't this affected all of the West? It hasn't affected all of the West. We talk about democracy and human rights because the memory of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. The memory of the Second World War tells us what happens when Nietzsche's ideas that the strong and beautiful and clever and ever can just wipe out anybody that they don't like. It tells us what that happens when you do that politically. And so, so we've been we've been rescued from that by the Second World War. Mm -hmm. But in economics, and I would say in sex, we are very Nietzschean. The strong sure. and beautiful moral duty to oppress the weak and ineffective. Yeah, maybe. I think to um, the, I, the the thing to go back to what you said um, to start that off the idea that um, you can do whatever you want as you don't hurt another person. I, I I feel like the problem with so many of those ideologies is that I agree with them, like syntactically as they're written, they are true, but I think they demand a great deal more thought than people are willing to give them. Um, so, uh, I feel like I'm quoting every person I hate in this conversation. Jesus. Are you familiar with like objectivism or Ayn Rand? Oh yeah. Oh, God. oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's the one of relationships is quite something. Yeah. Jesus. Okay. I'm going to, there's, there's, there's one term that comes from, I believe it comes from objectivism that I really like. Um, and it's called enlightened self-interest. Are you familiar with this at all? Yeah. Um, I've heard the term. Yeah. Yeah. So. <clears throat> the way that I build, um, if, we, if you ever want to have a tortured conversation on, on meta ethics, or maybe someday, um, the way that I build like most of my moral philosophy actually comes from a highly self-interested position to where at the end of the day, I just want the best world that I can have for me. And it's really what I want. Um, and it feels like a lot of people will kind of get to that area with like this almost extremely liberal area, this very individualistic or whatever. But if, if you take a little bit more time to think about what that means, like what does a good world for you look like? It's not a world where you have all the wealth, all the power, and you sit atop, you know, like the king, right? It's probably a world where the people around you are happy, you have a healthy family, your community is functioning well, um, your state is taking care of the people that need it the most. So like from these self-interested positions or um, from from these John Mills quotes, like as long as you're not harming another person, right? Well, there are a lot of harms that we can commit that are more 
ethereal or harder to see rather than like a harm isn't just me, you know, like punching another person, right? A harm might be me not, you know, stopping a little bit to let the old lady cross the street or a harm might be, um, you know, like somebody, a neighbor needs help with something and I could help very easily, but I choose not to, right? There are a whole bunch of harms that you commit due to inaction. I think that people don't take time to look at. Mm. And um, mm. yeah, I think that I feel like a lot of those philosophies work but you have to, they, they demand a great deal more attention um, than just like looking at them and be like, oh, true, I can do whatever the fuck I want as long as I'm not killing somebody. Um, and that's a lot of my issues with, I would say conservatism in the United States where it's like, okay, um, we, we talk about like wanting to make a better world and individual responsibility and all that, and that's great. But like, man, if you would just take like one moment to extend a little bit of that charity to a neighbor or to a neighboring city or a neighboring state or whatever, like everything works so much better for everybody. Like just think a little bit more on it and it feels like everybody would be so much better off. That tends to be like my approach to a lot of moral philosophy, yeah. So, so um, there's a couple of things that, that mm -hmm. come to mind there. First is when you say you agree with those statements, the statements like you can do whatever you like as long as you don't hurt anybody else uh -huh. um the the one thing that's true is that almost all economic and sexual interactions that is not the case almost all economic and sexual interactions by definition you're impacting other people i mean sex is always about someone else uh -huh. whether in imagined reality if we leave aside fetishes and things like that it's almost always about someone else so so even if you do think that that's true, and I don't happen to think it's true, I think that you know God cares that if you hurt it. God cares if you hurt yourself. So it's not even true mm -hmm. for me as a Christian. Small set, but for you, if you don't believe in God, it's it's a kind of small set that it applies to. It's a it's a hypothetical which is almost never true that you you don't affect anybody else. I think it's a useful. I think it's a useful thing. I think it's useful in framing laws. There is a mm -hmm. difference between you going about your own affairs and things that mainly affect you and you really directly impacting other. I think that's useful for framing laws, but as a moral philosophy, it's just, vanishing more than it's relevant well i think so the issue might be it's not more that like you say you shouldn't affect anybody else is that you shouldn't harm anybody else but i think that people don't spend a lot of time thinking about like the different types of harms that we could commit so make, absolutely yeah so somebody from like a highly liberalized perspective might make the argument that like if i want to be able to i should be able to sell heroin on a street corner i'm not forcing anybody to buy for me these are all consensual transactions yeah, they're yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah then it's like okay, in a very like narrow reading of not harming anyone else, I guess that could be true. But if we expand what we understand uh, harm to be a little bit, maybe we can get to areas where we say, even if we're not directly harming somebody, we are actually kind of engaging in things that are harmful to society as a whole. And maybe we can like curb some of these other activities based on that more fundamental statement of like, as long as I'm not hurting somebody else, if that makes sense. I can't, uh, I can't resist reading you a quote from Ayn Rand. Seeing oh, as man. Like oh man, oh man, oh boy. Anthem and good... Atlas Shrugged were the two. I, dude, I, I was a confused high school kid, okay? I can't help myself, but go for it. Hit me up. So, so here is her talking about relationships. I'm interested to know if you agree with this. Uh huh. This, this is one of her heroines talking in, um, I think it's in Atlas Shrugged. Okay. Um, oh, is it that? Yes, it is Atlas Shrugged. Do you remember you called me a traitor once? I want you to come to me seeking nothing but your own enjoyment. My way of trading is to know that the joy you give me is paid for by the joy you get from me, not by your suffering or mine. I don't accept sacrifices and I don't make them. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so, I mean, like, I. so the problem is that, like, on its face, I agree with a lot of what... Maybe this is just residual for me having <laughs> done this as a teenager. I agree with a lot of those statements on its face, but it feels like the way that people wield them in the real world ends up like so much different than how I wish they would. So in, in relation to that statement um, that she said, um, something that I've said before, and I, I, I can never, I have to be more careful with my words because I'm a little autistic or something. And that like, when I phrase things, I mean them in a certain way, but then they're taken and they mean way differently. So something I've said before in the past is that like, I view relationships around me as being uh, transactional. Like if I am in a relationship with somebody, I hope it's because they're getting something good for me and I'm providing something good for them. And when people have that framing of it, or when I use, especially that word transactional, um, people have this thing of like, okay, well, I should go around the world and manipulate and use people because that would be the best way to do it. Whereas the framing in my mind is just that like, I hope that if I'm engaging with another person, I hope that they're having fun with me. I hope that they enjoy their time with me and then I enjoy my time with them. So I hope that that's like a mutually beneficial experience. I don't believe in any sort of like, um, 
um, unconditional love or anything. Like, I think that it's all conditioned on us enjoying our, our time with each other. But yeah, I, I think I would agree with that statement. But I see how people take it and apply it in ways that I would disagree with the application of it. Agree with unconditional love. Do you let's let's back this let's just back up a little bit. Sure. Do you agree with um, sacrifices. So sacrifices is when you do something in a relationship that really hurts you or you don't want to do or it's difficult. Even if you don't go all the way to literally unconditional love. Uh -huh. and it's yeah, that's something we could talk about. But do you believe in sacrifices? So this is gonna get um uh, this is gonna get weird. Um, so, Don't say anything. yeah. Um, ha have you ever heard people quibble back and forth about like, can somebody be altruistic, or is every altruistic action ultimately self-serving? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. typically how I would view a, a sacrifice. Um, so, for instance, there are. Um, so I live in California right now. I moved three years ago out of Nebraska. Um, my child lives with my girlfriend, or my, no, not my girlfriend, Jesus, my ex-girlfriend. Um, and then when I travel, I, I visit them um, and anytime I'm traveling around. Um, and then we talk on Discord and everything. Now, as part of his life over there, um, I pay for his mom's house and his mom's car. Um, and the thought process is like, um, I don't want my kid to like hang out with me and he sees his cool, rich dad and blah, blah, blah. And then when he goes back to mom, you know, her life is a bit rougher. I want to make sure that we like, we, we're on equal footing there. I don't want him to ever feel that there's this huge disparity between our lifestyles. So if somebody were to ask me, am I making a sacrifice for the lifestyle of my child? I mean, like in a way I kind of am, but not really, it doesn't feel that way. Like I, I'm doing this because I want to do this. This isn't a sacrifice for me. Like I don't want my child's mom to, be a poor person that like is also like adversely affecting my child. So th that's kind of how I view sacrifice. If I'm making a sacrifice for somebody or like for my fiance, um, I, Jesus Christ, I hated it, but she wanted me to move to Sweden for a month and a half. And it's very hard to get me to another time zone, another con, Jesus, man. But I did it. But like, was that a sacrifice? I mean, like it kind of was, but the love that I have for her and my commitment to her is greater than any discomfort that I'll experience by moving for a month and a half. So that, that's how I view it. Like we kind of make sacrifices, but it's not truly a sacrifice in my mind. It's I'm choosing to undergo some level of pain because the, the maybe this utilitarian view, the, the, the outcome at the end is so much greater than whatever pain was experienced. If that makes sense. Yeah, it sounds as like you're translating everything into a cost benefit analysis and you have to use that language and say that it'll mm -hmm. pass a cost analysis. Yeah, basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and, and then as a challenge to me, Maybe you could think of this. I can't. Can you think of? Would there be a sacrifice that I would be willing to take that fails a cost-benefit analysis, or is there one that you'd be willing to take that fails a cost-benefit analysis, or do you just not view it in those terms? I'm curious. Um. Well, I suppose I try not to. View, well, okay. So my view, my view about ethics is that um, there's. Uh, um, my view about ethics is that there's deontology which is just kind of raw rules mm -hmm. then there's consequentialism and then there's virtue ethics and i see virtue ethics virtue ethics is a really slippery idea actually yeah i, I hate it we're... call it the moral toolbox yeah. they're a bunch of losers they just pick and choose you know screw those guys yeah go ahead i think for virtue ethics to make sense you need a picture or a story of a flourishing human life i just don't think it makes sense otherwise Okay. You need, a, you need a picture. You need some idea of what a virtuous person looks like, whether that's a story, whatever it is. And so as a Christian, I actually do think in virtue ethics terms where I think of Jesus being the, the virtuous person. Uh -huh. And I think a virtuous person will take account of consequences and they will know what good rules of action are. Uh -huh. And so I see virtue ethics as standing above the others. But... The reason I don't find virtue ethics incoherent the way you do and the way that I used to uh -huh. until I realized that I can think of Jesus as, as a virtuous person. So why am I saying all that? Um, I'm saying all that because when it comes to cost benefit analysis, I do them sometimes. Um, I think it makes sense to look at pros and cons. I think it makes sense to look at consequences of your actions. And I think that's part of moral reasoning, but I certainly don't feel the need to make everything pass that test. Okay. Um, because sacrifices that you make, that, you know, that uh, 
yeah, I, ju I just don't find it always a helpful test. And also, I think it's intellectually, perhaps, I'm not saying this of you, but it can be intellectually dishonest when people do things for other reasons and then they say, well, it must have passed a cost-benefit analysis. I wouldn't have done it if it hadn't passed a cost-benefit analysis. So somehow the benefits exceeded these costs. Oh, I don't know what these benefits are, but they, they must have been there for me to have gone ahead and done it. You know, it's could, the, could we one. frame like a, like a drug addiction or something like that? Could that be like, like I decided to do a drug? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, that's right. Rational. That, yeah, that's uh -huh. true. That's true. There must be something I'm getting out of this. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. Uh -huh. Well, there are other reasons for people doing things other than sort of weighing up alternatives. Yeah, so for sure. Important. I can agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that, I guess that was just ultimately, that's how I frame sacrifice. Um, yeah. Is it something that I ultimately like, and I agree, you're not making this every time. If I'm driving home and my fiance is like, um, can we please stop someplace? I want to get something. And I really don't want to, I'm not in my head, you know, like, okay, well the 30 minutes here could have been spent, but I'm like, I'm not, I'll probably just like, okay, yeah, we'll do it. Whatever. Yeah. It's not like yeah. an active process every single time a calculation is made. Yeah. There's a really interesting experiment about this where there was a, um, there was an experiment where if you lied, you could make yourself and everybody else in the experimental room better off. And that's a very clever experiment because, um, and then they found that about 30% of people would refuse to lie. Okay. So they made everybody better. And it's a clever experiment because you don't have to worry about how you value you versus other people. If you make everybody better off, you can control for that. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, it, it, that, that doesn't pass any kind of cost-benefit analysis. But then you can say, oh, the people must have got utility out of telling the, the truth. But then that's kind of tautological. You, you may be kind of, yeah. It's, well, that's it's, the, um, I think that was the problem is because anytime I talk in those terms, um, everything becomes like, um, is it tautological or is it all, like reductive to the point of absurdity? Where if every single sacrifice is um, actually a person acting their self-interest, then by that definition, literally every single thing you do is self-interest. So it becomes yeah. pointless to even bring it up. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. If if everything is self-interested, then self-interest just becomes a meaningless term. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Or uh, maybe arbitrary. There's a word I'm looking for, but yeah, it's like a pointless. Yeah. Uh, kind yeah. of on that same end. Just I don't. We don't have to revisit the whole discussion, but a fun challenge that I've heard to physicalists or materialists is. Um, you ask somebody like, do you believe in the supernatural? And you're like, well, no, I think there needs to be a physical accounting for things. It's like, okay, so let's say that a supernatural event occurred. And you're like, okay, yeah. Well, let's say that one occurred that you could actually test for and empirically prove time and time again. And it's like, okay, yeah. If that was the case, would you still call it supernatural then? Or would it become like a physical thing? And it's like, well, I guess it'd become a physical thing. So in that case, you don't believe in anything supernatural because even if you find something supernatural, as soon as you find a way to test it, it will be subsumed by a physical world and everything is essentially. I've heard that challenge before. To, it's, uh, uh, it's redundant or absurd to call things, like to be a materialist or a physicalist because ultimately anything that you can quantify will be subsumed in your physicalist or materialist yeah. interpretation of the world. Um, yeah. Yes, okay, that's true. It becomes mm -hmm. tautological. Yeah. 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 The other thing, the other thing I think about to go full circle, and then then I probably should let you go. But the other thing that um, I think about um, miracles is about how modern science has changed our conceptions of plausibility. I mean, one of the things that's really remarkable about um, scientific discoveries is that they are um, they're so. Uh, some of them are so bizarrely improbable, like the idea that we're sitting on other parts of the world and we're talking to each other, uh -huh. and that's happening because there are these waves flying through the world that nobody can see. Uh -huh. I mean, if you told that to somebody two centuries ago, they'd just say you're absolutely crazy. Uh -huh. And so I think, um, I think, see, this is one of the arguments um, against uh, a Hume's argument against miracles uh -huh. is that it's all based on plausibility. You know, you think something's improbable, and so you just don't look at the evidence for it. But um, if I can quote a philosopher here, um, he's talking about the idea of strength of analogy. So the strength of analogy argument is that something's only probable if it somehow connects to your experience. Uh -huh. Okay. So you've got an analogy in your experience to say this could happen. Uh -huh. So here's a quote from Alan Hayek. If strength of analogy is such a crucial determinant of a reasonable person's probability, he says function, but he means probability, of a reasonable person's probability, then that person should also be sceptical about all spectacular scientific discoveries, and that is absurd. So what he's saying there is that there are plenty of things in science that we've discovered that five minutes before they were discovered, you'd say they're just impossible. Sure. You know, they're just but then they, they turn out being possible.
Sure. Yeah. Um, as a, as a random fun question, um, I often hear when I have conversations with other philosophy people, um, educated ones, not me who's wiki educated, um, oftentimes they'll make comparisons of what I'm saying. Like, oh, it sounds like you, uh, you would like Hume. You would believe this thing or Hume says this or Hume says that. I hear that a lot in terms of, so he sounds like maybe he's a cool guy. Although you're telling me that some people were critical of some things you said. Um, do you believe this? Okay. I have bought and read a couple philosophy books. I read um, some stuff by Bertrand Russell. I read a bit of um, Capital uh, by Marx. And um, I've read a little bit of Hume's uh, Treatise on Humanity, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You should say something that you, yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't think that the reading is difficult because it's the material is dense. I think that a lot of the writing is just really, really, really bad. Do you agree with that or yeah. do you disagree with that? <laughs> yes, I do. So okay. I do. So John Stuart Mill, um, try reading on Liberty. It's beautiful writing, mm-hmm. but he goes on and on and on for about three or four pages before you get to anything substantial. Um, what? Yeah, so um, some writing is really bad. People say that Hume is very clear, mm-hmm. um, but I think what's true of Hume is, is true of a student I used to have at Oxford. He was an incredibly clear writer, and so I said to him, listen, be careful because um, when you write something that's a really good argument, it'll be absolutely clear. When you write something that's wrong, it'll be absolutely clear that what you're talking is nonsense. Oh, geez, sure. So uh, Hume, I think, is very, very clear, but people have criticised him for, um, yeah, this uh, this scepticism about causation and and scepticism about induction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some people, but they're not nearly as bad to read as... Um, um, Oh, who's that? Uh, the father of existentialism, um, the guy. Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. So, did you know that I'm fluent in German? Um, I didn't, but you said you study moral philosophy, so that's not surprising to me. Here's, here's why I think I'm fluent in German. If you can read a text in English and read it in another language, uh-huh. and the level of comprehension is exactly the same. You'd say you're fluent in that language, right? Sure, maybe. So I read I read the first page of Being and Time by Heidegger okay. in English and in German, and I had exactly the same level of comprehension. Which was so I conclude. <laughs> oh, okay, Zero. gotcha. Oh, okay, okay, I understand. Never mind. You're not fluent in German. Okay. Oh, okay. So if you want to, if you want to, um, if you want to be, 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 be bamboozled by philosopher, read uh, read Heidegger. It's completely incomprehensible to me. Gotcha. <laughs> I my uh, very rudimentary analysis was when I I started counting commas and sentences. And when I'm getting to nine plus commas in the same sentence, it's like Jesus Christ. Okay, this is or I don't know where the fuck I am. I feel like I'm smoking weed and I am forgetting where the beginning of the sentence is by the time I finish the end of it. Um, okay. Yeah, I was I was curious about that because because sometimes in reading, I'm like if I, if I read something like two or three or four or five times, like okay, I understand what I've read. Did it really need to be written like this? Like I feel like this must have been able to be to be written a bit clearer. But yeah, I don't know. I, I was just, I was curious on that because you've got the the, edu- yeah. the educational background, so yeah. 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 And cool. then also to you know. Fuck them, okay? Philosophers have this problem where they get so upset that pop philosophers like Sam Harris or Jordan Peterson become popular, and it's like, okay, well, you know, their writings are way more comprehensible. Like, man, you, yeah. like, you have to, like, philosophy is like, I actually hate this so much because I didn't truly get into anything related to philosophy, and I'm still barely into it, really, but I didn't really get into it a lot until I think it was in my mid-20s. Um, and man, just learning, like, just learning very fundamental elementary things about philosophy enriches so many other parts of your life. It's actually like so cool to be able to think about things in like different ways, which is like ultimately I think what philosophy has helped me with. It's just giving me like different ways to think about things or to question things that seem like super stable. And it's like, well, is it? Um, and the idea that that was so inaccessible for so long because of the writing, because uh, I guess when you go to uh, university for philosophy, the rest of your life is going to be writing papers about like meta epistemology or, you know, yeah. your particular interpretation of something that Kant said about universal trends and it's like Jesus Christ like ah there must be a better way to make it more relatable to the average person and but instead it's been totally ceded to I guess like pop philosophers and everything yeah yeah well that's one of the things I I have enjoyed about writing and teaching is that I try and make ideas Uh um, relatively comprehensible people say I'm I'm good at it but somebody else is really good at it there's a um, guy called C. Stephen Evans, who wrote a book called History of Western Philosophy, which is actually really clear as well. Uh There there are some people that do have that gift of being able to do that. Um, Yeah, I I love reading stuff that's Uh well-written. Anyway, um, I I think it's been a great conversation. Thanks very much. Um, Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, 
Wait, you, you, it cut off as I talked. What did you say? Oh, did you, do you have anything else you want to talk about or ask? Or? Um, not that I can think of right now, but if you ever, you can always shoot me an email and yeah, we can always chat again if you want to. Yeah. That'd be fine. That'd um, be wait, fine. real quick. Um, you mentioned the books you've written. Do you want to plug like a social media or something you've written recently? The most recent thing that people can find you on Amazon or something like that? No, just to, just the the one book that I've written called Western Fundamentalism took me 20 years to write. So I figure Jeez. that's a, uh, okay. that's enough for one book. <laughs> okay. So I, you actually, I want to ask one question because um, uh, I did music. Um, th th hold on. I, this kind of relates. Okay. When you write a book like that, um, one problem that you have when you do when you write pieces is you you can torture it to death. You never want to put it down because there's always something you see you can change. How, how do you when when you've written your book? At what point are you like, okay, I'm done, or are you like infinitely editing, re-editing, changing, adding? Like, ah, yeah, yeah, how do you yeah. how do you come to that decision? I'm curious. You spent some twenty years yeah. on something. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think I think one of the main things, I don't know if this happened with music for you, but one of the main things is getting other people to read it. Yes. And um, I had, um, I, so the chapter that I originally wrote on the sexual revolution, so the, the chapters are, there's an introduction which talks about how we all have basic beliefs and that they can't all be proved. And then I go through democracy, free market liberalism and sexual freedom mm -hmm. as a sort of things. And the chapter on the sexual revolution that I first wrote I gave it to someone to read, a woman, and she was so critical. It said it was absolutely terrible, uh -huh. and they uh, gave me this the roughest criticism I've ever received. But it was great. Um, I went back because a lot of the things I was saying, I didn't have much historical background, so I went and read a book by um, I think it was Nancy McLean, the History of Feminism in the U.S. and stuff. Uh -huh. A lot of primary documents. Read it all really carefully. Um, went and spoke to a professor. Uh, one, one who's sort of left and one who's sort of right and they each gave me a book read both of them and was able to synthesize them and so so i think listening i think getting other people to read it's really important um as to uh, as to editing editing never stops i've i've made a rule for myself that whenever i publish anything i try never to read it again because i will always be guaranteed to find a mistake uh -huh. what do you feel about music that you do you, do you do you compose now um, I, not really. I do small things for my community and then I have them build on it. It's like a little game kind of, or a little challenge, I call it. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I went to college for music and I was doing, um, I wanted to major in performance and minor in composition. And, um, yeah, there was like a thing yeah. where if I ever like, um, because I was working with some there, there, it's like a, it's like a computer software to make music. They're called a digital audio workstation. Um, mm -hmm. but there is this idea that like, um, especially as a student, I might like write a piece and I think it's okay. And then like a year later, I'll look at something. It's like, oh my God, like I could do this or that or this or that or this or that. Um, and I, I mean, I never like made an album or anything, but I always wondered for musicians or for authors because we're constantly growing and learning and challenging ourselves, or I would hope like, um, do you ever get to a point where like you look at something you've written or a piece you've composed like five years later and you're like, man, hold on, wait, I'm gonna go back and change this or do this. But obviously you can't re-release it because it looks self-indulgent mm -hmm. and it's just kind of silly. Yeah, but that just seems like a difficult what thing. About, what about pain? Did, did you find that some things were painful to write? Mm, what do you, no, what do you mean by that? Well, I found that with um, with a couple of chapters in the book, I actually, and I find this with academic work too, some of my, my best academic work, I have to get into a total vortex mm -hmm. where the world doesn't seem real and I'm a pain to live with. Um, but, I, but I have to get into a vortex and it almost hurts to get it, to pull it out of me. That doesn't happen to you with music? You're in the wrong no, position. but I don't think I've either music is different or I'm just not at that level of composition. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't, yeah, that might be the case with some more serious artists that there are. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's serious or not, but I found that some things were just a real struggle, but then, then when you get past it, you think, ah, that's, that's actually better written. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. All right. Well, Hey, listen, I super appreciate the conversation. It's been fun. I've got a couple of new things to think about. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah, if there's ever anything else, just feel free to shoot me an email. We can chat. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Cool. Thanks See a ya. lot. Have a good one. What a fucking nerd. God, I would pay so much money to see that guy have to debate uh, Demon Mama. <laughs> um, Destiny Bayes theorem describes the probability of an event. How often does anyone start with a 0% certainty when you hear about an event? I think I would argue that some people do, and it's really bad. This it kind of it's funny because like a direct thing of like a like a Bayes theorem 
might be that one interpretation of that might be me saying, I always tell people, you should always be able to ask yourself, what would it take to convince you otherwise? And if there's no answer, then that's a problem. I think a, a, a Bayesian way of looking at that statement is, what would it take for you to change your prior to something? Um, and if the answer is nothing, then your prior is either 0% or 100%, which means something is wrong there, right? That would be my, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Jesus, okay. I have, um, you asked about how to get out of that paradox of absolutes. Russell wrote about it talking about to Epi Epimenid Epimenides paradox. I feel like I've read about this before. It's something about like being able to make an absolute statement about no absolutes or something. But uh, hold on, fuck. I told some other kid that I would do, I, wait, I shouldn't say kid. I told a person that I would do like a podcast of theirs, but he said I could stream it. I don't know what it's even about. I'd have to go back and look at it. Um, but um, I need to use the real quick. I'm, I'll play donos and then I'll be right back. I'm sorry. Jeez, one sec. That conversation went on for a lot longer than I thought it would, which is good. It was a fun conversation. I always like talking to that guy. Every conversation with that guy is super cool. <clears throat> I'll be back one second.